hopefully that works <laughs> we'll see yeah it's probably a message recording in progress so hopefully that's fine okay awesome stuff people are joining this is good news morning reese good morning sam how was your birthday very nice thanks are you wiser today oh never <laughs> <laughs> that's the drink yeah yeah absolutely um okay i will progress i will repeatedly reshare this link to the um to the mirror board so people can view it as we go um but we'll start properly in about 10 minutes um as a warm-up for people who are here currently um from the discussions in the workshop yesterday does anyone have any thoughts of things they'd like to discuss to do with habitats that sort of questions that were raised by discussions about experiments and about astronaut and about um about experiments and about, about human about life support systems does anyone have any points they'd like to bring up that came up in discussions yesterday that we can we can go into further that might relate to how habitats can help with life support or with experiments just as a sort of icebreaker as a before we start well uh probably well, i could think of about 20 things but uh, obviously hey, mate, let's, go, let, 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 let's hear some because it'd be good to no, try and direct the discussion yeah no it, it was it was interesting um no surprise from a not just the chasm ms uk space generally but just the world and anything to do with um projects people working together developing everything else it was it was great because lots of uh, discussion was had about have, uh, around the world the different haves and stuff uh, so a lot from karen um and two or three others whose names i can't fully re always recall but it was there were like similar problems people had faced and then there were different things so uh, the, the phrase one size fits all or one size doesn't fit all came up numerous times uh and it's good that most of our chasm stuff uh, yeah, like you say you, you kick off ideas the mirror boards are just to start discussion and it, and it did because there was lots of things some people had seen a similar problem others had had individual different things um but equally it showed that with a bit of collaboration like without making it too restrictive having some guidelines for all sorts of areas whether it's the, the energy side of the hab you know like pro providing it or the, the structure the, the, the regimes even the protocols like there was one bit i think you heard yesterday um from uh, through uh, paddy's uh, workshop somebody left the lights on on the first one <laughs> <laughs> to keep the experiment the same that the next 10 days people had to have the lights on which was actually was interesting because it showed some quite sort of um i won't say serious problems but you know obviously things that were not the nicest to try and cope with um but it was just the whole idea of like, working together to get at least a basic guideline that isn't a set in stone fixed rules but at least to help um, and sometimes people don't think of so i was absolutely well say stunned i'm not a psychologist and i'm not um been not been involved in the sort of uh, hab uh, trials that are going on around the world uh not in recent years i've never done anything exactly like that but another day i can explain some of the stuff to do with the environmental trials as well as human people trials but i was absolutely stunned at um not just one group, but a few times around the world, people can be quite selfish or, or there's an embarrassment of, I need more water than somebody else, or I think I do. Um, and, and to actually take um, more water, more energy, more time, uh, it was absolutely surprising. But it's great to share that because then <laughs> other people could be aware when they're planning a mission or, or planning the next phase of work in a hab. That's but really it was interesting. Like so many areas, I think we could, literally, I'm mean, sure Eleanor will be really pleased that I think there's enough for at least another one, if not three conferences. The, oh, the, sure. The things that have it's opened up in a positive way, you know, all sorts of things, not just problems, but even there in the problem, everybody goes, oh, right, okay, I hadn't thought about how you yeah. have to monitor that. So, yeah, that's for my little input. Yeah. I mean, I think you make a good point is that, is that even if we can't get an answer from this, from this session, because of course we can answer the whole question in, in, in what, two hours? Um, but if we can just work out what parts of the habitat design space are the contentious parts that gives us a place to work at in future workshops and say well next year we need to definitely discuss like human factors architecture and say that that's actually a really contentious point that people have very different opinions about and there's no good solution for whereas 
logistics is much more of a solved problem. That'd be really nice to be able to say that as an outcome and, and work out where the where the gaps in knowledge are and where the the issues are, so we can move from there into into sort of future work. That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah, and yours is a good good response, Sam. You know, because as you say, you can cause it. It might only be twenty percent of areas that uh, all all the aspects that I have, but everybody, well, a lot of people find is a common thing, whether it's water. Uh, usage, storage, uh, replenishment, or energy, or whatever. But as you say, so so if everybody's happy with the mm. main structures or the doors and the floors and everything else, and you concentrate on the areas, and we can help each other um, on that. But for, for one person, it might be slightly different. But yeah, as you say, in the main, it will focus the time sensibly mm. on the bits that are the biggest problem. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? So I think some people joined halfway through. We're just as an icebreaker before we start properly, just discussing if there's any points from yesterday. Um, that came up talking about um talking about astronauts talking about experiments um talking about sort of various bits and pieces that we can use to direct the conversation about habitats which is the, the benefit of going last is that we can have a set agenda for questions you want to answer so if anyone's got any points that they thought were sort of either raised as questions to investigate further yesterday or or insightful things about habitats and the way they relate to experiments or anything else um it would be good to, to bring that up now and we can make a note of it if anyone's got any. Yeah, I think the clear message was the centrality of energy production and the closed loop of energy production and water recycling from clean to grey to, to black and back again. And in a way, because you've got these closed systems, you need to build around these as and have these items as your core thing around which you build around, not the other way around. Okay, that's interesting. That's a very interesting message. So that, that has potentially some implications. So talk about this a little bit. Um, so we can definitely come on to that later on and look at what people think about the way to handle that. So thanks for that, Rhys. Okay. And I, and I think in a way you could even generalize that more to not just water plus energy it is what closed systems do you have and then you build around there and i think food production would also be mm. one of those items because that would be a key part of your hub and then mm. in a way you build around those systems yeah that's actually very interesting because coming at it from a from a space station design perspective which i've done a bit of work on there's many it, it's very very common to start with this sort of very high level systems diagram and then start working down and then you let the systems you take the architecture and mm. i think it's it's very much a terrestrial thing or sort of a, a small I, scale earth building thing so yeah i build a, around my bed my living room and where can i put my kitchen where can i put what is in in essence it would be the other way around you know my key um systems right where can yeah. i fit a bed yeah that's a very interesting point so that, that, that may be the kind of thing where where analog is sort of not being hampered by, but it's sort of still tied to, to earth architecture practices. And if you if you were to go to to somewhere like um, the HERA mission at JS at Johnson Space Center, they may do it very differently there because they're using the expertise from people who work on space habitats directly. So it might be it, that would be very interesting to compare the two approaches um, and see if there's a different way of doing it, or if it's actually less than we think and they're just doing it in a in a sort of in a slightly different. And I think you've got the ISS as a halfway house. Mm. You know, I think they've got they've split theirs into modules. Yeah, which I'm not absolutely. sure if that's optimal or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we got, oh, there's some stuff about modularity in the um in the in the notes already. So hopefully we'll get onto that. It is now half past. I'm going to reshare the link to the mirror board in chat because I don't know how Zoom works with chat recording with people being able to see chat from the past. So. It would be great if people can get onto that. I can see Karen, you're on that already. Um, should we start now-ish then, I guess? It's half past. We'll we'll do a little bit of intro as we go in. So um, it'd be great if people can turn the video on or, or microphone on so we can have a discussion as we go, um, just because it makes it a bit, feel a bit more like a session, a bit, a bit less like a lecture. Um, and I say that sounding like a lecture already, so apologies. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone. Um, we do this is the online version of the Habitat Workshop. So 
trying to use um, the fact we've got so many people from different habitats and with different experience around analog missions together to try and talk about um, some of the similarities, people's approaches to habitat design, some of the differences, some of the lessons learned, things you want to do in the future, things that you see as issues in the field as a whole, um, and all things like that. So trying to use this as a chance to, to really have an in-depth um, and quite focused look at the way analog habitats are designed currently and how that can maybe change in the future. Um, I'm Sam, I'm an engineering master's student in Cambridge. Um, I've been doing CASM for about eight months now um, and I'll be sort of chairing this and trying to get the discussion going and also taking all the notes as we go. So don't let me be the one asking the questions. If you want to discuss with each other and based on people's experience, please do that and I'll just scribble furiously on the mirror board as we go. Um, as a starter, could people in no particular order sort of introduce yourself briefly and what your experience with habitats is or what your experience with analogs is so we can try and work out what playing field we're currently starting on? Um, Karen, I know you, you've, you've already had, you, you've already been, you've got a lot of experience. So do you mind starting as a way to get, kick this off or? Sure, just one sec, let me switch my camera on so you, you can. You can see the sunshine in my face. <laughs> I'm <rubbing Yeah>. in. <laughs> Very jealous. Um, yeah, so I'm Karen. Uh, my analog experience is basically I'm a member of the Austrian Space Forum. I've been a member for a couple of years now. Um, I'm a flight planner for the Amadi uh, program. Um, uh, the uh, latest missions I, I was in was the Amadei 20 last October in in uh, Israel, where I was for one month in the mission uh, support center in Innsbruck, together with Stefan. <laughs> so it's also here. <clears throat> and um, uh, yeah, we were involved in the, well, previously, uh, before the mission started, um, the work of the flight planner is really to kind of project manager for experiments, and I was responsible for five experiments, two technical and three psychological experiments, and then during the mission we just uh, plan uh, the tasks of the astronauts and of the on-site support center. Um, I have also uh, participated in uh, so far nine uh, virtual analog missions in Habitat Marte, also as a mission commander. And my company is an official business partner of Habitat Marte. Um, and other than that, I uh, I am a psychologist, so I'm very much interested in uh, human uh, factors in space flight, and uh, I'm also. Um, a, tr uh, a trainer. Some some of you know me from like you, Sam, from Eleanor <laughs> as a trainer for the uh, for the next generation of Austrian Space Forum um, <clears throat> volunteers. Um, and I also provide commercial trainings to space companies in the areas of project management, intercultural competence, and leadership skills. Awesome. I think you have, you have a lot to talk about then because we've got a lot of talk about human factors on the board. So I'm sure you'll have a very interesting. Point of view on that so yep. it's great to have you here um someone else lorenzo is next on my screen so we'll just work down if anyone else wants to introduce themselves just unmute your microphone on and we'll can you hear me yes okay awesome. hi uh, my name is uh, lorenzo and um i'm uh, studying um, aerospace engineering uh, engineering uh, at the moment and um i'm a young um, researcher uh, for uh, space debris monitoring uh, at my university and uh, here I also got in touch recently with uh, an admissions uh, for uh, some um, university projects that uh, are not already have not already started but uh, it's uh, a really interesting topic for me so I think uh, uh, I can still help you <laughs> no that's great it's great to have that experience on thank um, you anyone else if not, I will pick on people. Hello, I'm Stefan yep. Um I'm testing this thing because I participated to uh, Amadi 20, uh, to touch on 20, uh, and also on the 2018, I'm testing on how, uh, how all the um, the mission will bring together to just to have 
common tests and not to, uh, to, to interfere. But then finally, I wasn't able to attend the conference last April because it was uh, uh, the same weekend that the um, body, uh, science world, world workshop, if I let you to. Yes. Yeah, that was an unfortunate timeline with that, where we had some people called in from the conference. But the, yeah. thanks for being here. That's great. Um, so great to have that experience as well. Anyone else before I start spitting and picking at names? <laughs> Hi, yeah, I was waiting for you to read mine, but okay. <laughs> I am Małgorzata, I'm from Poland. Day-to-day uh, -day basis, I'm a bioinformatician and a molecular biologist. And uh, my connection with habitats dates a bit back. Uh, I was the flight director for the first uh, mission with the um, person with disabilities. So that was Icarus, and I think it was four years back or, or something like this. And, and I was cooperating with Lunaris also as a scientific officer. So trying to um, maybe plan what experiments on a biological side could be done in, in this environment. So that's that's that's, that's really that's really interesting. That's really, really cool. Um, Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, who else? Uh, Nithyasri, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Do you want to share your experience or, or introduce yourself briefly? If I pronounce that correctly, and apologies if not. No, I guess not. If you're if you can put it on chat, that's also fine. If you can't, um, if your microphone's not working, or it's not, or you can't use it for some reason, or not, I guess. Okay. Um, Alan, if you've had a chat already, you want to just say who you are briefly and your experience with analogs. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and everybody. Uh, Alan Field, uh, part of uh, MSUK and supporting CASM since the uh, well, April conference that we had earlier in the year, but uh, from last year. Uh, I've not actually done any work directly uh, on HABs um, at the moment, but in the past, um, the areas that have helped look at this sort of thing. I've done a lot with human factors interface, more so small equipment, uh, the human interaction to switches and controls and visual interface and that sort of thing. I have helped guide people and, and help design the inside of vehicles and some, uh, I won't call it a hab, but um, part-time uh, pods and things that either go on the back of a vehicle that then can be put on the ground. Um, and I worked and I had a 13 years in the uh, Royal Air Force um, and uh, all sorts of adventures there that for another day. Uh, suffice to say, I had some experience of working in um, little pods on vehicles, which is like a mini hab. Um, and I certainly saw some of the problems and bad things that were designed and tried to help and guide um, when I had the chance in the latter years uh, in the Air Force working at British Aerospace. Um, I did have a little look uh, and many, many years ago when I was working on a program called HOTOL, which is the forerunner to what Paddy's. Uh, the company Paddy's at Reaction Engines is looking at doing these days. And inside that, it had a, a pod that was going to be part of an early space station or possibly going to the moon or Mars in, in its day in the early 80s. Um, but I've, I've, I've worked with uh, equipment design primarily on the safety, reliability and the human factor side of things uh, for about 40 years now. So whilst I haven't done anything in a hab directly, I can see and hear people's accounts of some of the problems, some of the good parts, some of the difficulties and the things that hopefully we can all share and work towards uh, making easier, better, safer, more human um, friendly designs. Uh, that's me. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, and lastly, Reese. No, last, but not, last but not least. Yeah. So like, just like Alan, I'm with Mass Society UK. Um, helped with the last chasm in in Cambridge, that was a great event, and hoping this will be a great event too. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll, if, if people come in halfway through, which they might well, then we'll just try and introduce them as they go. But um, for now, I will one more time share the link to the, to the Miro board in the chat. If you want to join there, that will probably be easier for you to be able to zoom in on things. Um, but I will also share my screen, if I can get that to work correctly, um, which is this one here. So, can people see that currently? So, 
someone give me a shout if you can see that just so i know i'm not going insane. Uh, we can we can i mean okay. i can awesome thank you um that's great so this sort of if you can see this or you can see it on your own screen um this kind of lays out the structure of the workshop as we will be doing it. So we'll be going through different things that influence habitat design, um, the design of the mission and the mission selection, the architecture of the habitat itself, human factors and technical stuff, um, things like power systems and facilities. And this is sort of intended to be a sort of to guide the discussion rather than to actually be an agenda. Um, so hopefully it's not too formal. If you want, if you want to say something that's not on the not on here, please do. Um, but this is intended to sort of guide us through and we'll talk through for each of these points and these sub points in your experience what's the important part of this is it good to have this uh, how do you do it and was it effective um, also but what's what gaps are missing so if you see something that you didn't do and you'd like to do or something that you think is missing from the current sort of scope of analog research um, and then finally as a sort of discussion for each of the main points we'll say is there a single best design for each of these parts? Is there a single best architecture? Is it useful? And is it useful to even ask that question? So is it is it a reasonable thing to discuss the single best human factors? Or is it going to be, is there actually many more things at play that mean we can't have one single coherent design for the whole thing? Um, and hopefully that'll let us discuss as a group sort of um, if there is a, a way we can improve habitat design as a whole, or if we need to have a more specialized approach, or if there's certain lessons that everyone should know before starting um but again if you have anything else you want to add to do with anything whether it's what we're looking at at the time or just a general thought um this is a guide of the structure not the actual structure itself so hopefully that's all good um and i think we'll start at the obvious place to start which is with mission design um so of course the habitat you're working with um depends enormously on the mission you're designing with and there's a sort of back and forth there um and the, the mission that you select will be based on the habitat you have and if you're designing a habitat for a specialist mission um like amadi or like someone like Chilice, then you'll design a habitat around the mission um so this is just to try and give us a discussion a sort of kick off a discussion about what people think about this and what people think is the a sort of good approach for how to tackle this and, and what's important um so does anyone have any initial thoughts about, about how habitat design and mission design influence each other? And if not, we can try and drill down into, into sub questions a bit more in a focused way. But just to start it off. One of the, one of the things that came out yesterday was that um, each, each mission and each group, obviously there's huge differences from um, an almost volunteer, very low cost based almost, I, want, I, I don't want to call it amateur, but, you know, sort of enthusiast driven through to the like, Austrian Aerospace or NASA and, you know, huge cost, uh, huge availability of resources uh, and everything else. And that will dictate a lot of these things as well. Okay. That's a very good point. Has anyone, has anyone got any sort of anything like to add to that from their experience, um, especially looking at Amity, because you guys obviously do have a lot of resources. <laughs> Have a lot of resources compared to some groups. Yeah, so as you already uh, mentioned, it's it's um, it depends a bit on the mission. I mean, it has advantages to have a permanent habitat. Yeah, as we heard from Habitat Marty yesterday, for example. Yeah, you can uh, you can uh, integrate things like uh, hydroponics, aquaponics. Um, if you build a habitat just for a specific mission for a few weeks, um, you are limited in, in, in long-term experiments, of course. Um, but it, it really depends on, on, on what you want to achieve. Yeah? Um, of course, it, it also then depends on where you choose to go. A habitat inside a lava cave looks different than a habitat high up in the mountains looks different like an under, than a, like an underwater habitat. Yeah, so you have also some geographic um, limitations or or advantages that <laughs> maybe you can uh, use in a lava cave or or somewhere else. So it depends very much on on what is the goal of the mission and what is the goal of the organization uh, uh, conducting the missions, yeah. Okay. 
So it has everything has advantages and disadvantages. And for uh, for a mission, it's it's important to find to find uh, the best solution uh, for for that mission. Okay. So so from Amity's point of view, it's very much starting with the mission and then working backwards to the habitats rather than the other way around. So you. Yeah, so um, depending on the focus of the experiments, um, some experiments are done in ice caves, or they have been done in ice caves, ice caves in the past. Um, now most of the missions are in in deserts. Yeah, it's also a bit about outreach. Yeah, the more countries you visit with your missions, uh, the more exposure you you get, and it can also help a country. To build up some some uh, space industry, yeah. For example, that's a very interesting point of view. Yeah, especially for a, for a sort of traveling habitat like like Amity has, it's a very interesting reasoning behind why to move it, not just for the technical stuff, but for the actual learning about it. Yeah, exactly. And if it's both sides, I think as well, the country being visited and the smaller groups as much as the bigger, sometimes bigger groups. Um, so it's mutually beneficial, I think. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good point to bring out okay so it has so, all to do with financing the mission of course yes yes which i, which I haven't really covered too much here because i think that sort of deserves its own separate category about talking about mission financing so i'm not yeah. gonna but we can talk we i haven't put anything down here that if people think it's relevant to talk about which of course it is we can we can go more towards that um, yeah, it's it's it has to do with the habitat design. Yeah, mm. do you pitch a tent or you do you build a fully fledged habitat for twelve people? Yeah. So actually, so, so just sorry to sort of keep pushing on Amity because I think it's a really interesting um, case study in one direction. And and Stefan, if you want to answer as well, because so you're you've got experience with it at the same time. Um, Amity's Amity's approach is very much start with the science outcomes and then work backwards towards the location and the mission design based on that. Do people have, especially the Amity team, but anyone else, does anyone have opinions on if they think that's necessarily the best way to do it or the best approach as an analog for real mission? Or perhaps if there's a different way that you could have tackled it from start, starting, with, starting with the location, trying to work out what science can be done there. Not necessarily, like, which may be more accurate to working on Mars or working on the moon. Um, if you, your landing site is set by not just science goals, but technical goals. So we're interested to hear if anyone's got any opinions on that and, and things that could relate to that. Uh, I would say if I can uh, just add, because uh, um, that there was a difference between the MID-18 and MID-20, because MID-20 was in cooperation with DMARS organization. So the habitat was provided with DMARS and also the mission was different because on the 18, the Tenog astronaut do um, EVA, they come back to the, to, to non, not really a bit, it was not uh, an habitat, it was just uh, uh, like a camp. So for example, in MID 20, the analog astronaut was in full isolation during the mission, compared to the, to the 18, because due to the fact there was, there was no, like it was pointed out, there was development of the uh, of the of the site and also the uh, the partners organizations. Uh, so there was also another point that was general because due to the to the to the, to the, to the logistics, it also depends if what uh, to to bring the technology be that or not okay that's really interesting actually so were there questions about so so I, i'm sorry i feel like i'm picking an amity here we'll move on after this um was there did, did you feel like that having a permanent habitat made the mission better on amity 20 rather than previously um uh, for me if i we if we if we are if we're pointing on the desertion of the astronaut, yes okay but but also it was a fact there was a cooperation with the teamers that probably the habitat. Okay, that's very interesting. So that's sort of highlighting almost what the what the advantage of having a habitat is in the first place, rather than the camp that lets you do more stuff about the crew itself. 
that was yeah. a really interesting point. Um, yeah, great point, Stefan. That. Great points, well put. Okay. That's a very, a very nice point. Um, okay, what else can we go on? Should we, okay, how about, um, so duration is, I think, worth mentioning. Um, and I'm going to pick on someone who's not Amity this time. Um, in terms of designing a habitat around a different mission duration, what what are people's thoughts about this? About having a having a habitat that's designed for a range of mission durations, um, something like high seas, where they have obviously they've run multi month missions there, but also two week missions, um, versus having one that's kitted out for a very specific length of time, um, something more like a sepia spaces where they they design it very precisely around. We have two weeks to run it in. Um, do people have any opinions on on what are the, which of those is better or which of those might be um, more effective from a design point of view or from a, a point of view of running the mission itself? Or or does it make no difference? Um, I'm just adding because no one's speaking because uh, I think that's... <laughs> That's really tough, tough one to, to, to discuss because, of course, when you have different goals of the missions, you have different designs that are useful. From my perspective, I, I worked with a habitat that was a permanent habitat. And also, as a biologist, I would like to see a little bit longer missions than shorter ones because it's more that you can do with you know on experimental side when you when you have this longer periods of time but when it comes to some basic stuff like people have to place to sleep right office to discuss laboratory uh, toilets whatever I, I think this would not differ as much between the permanent habitat in which you have two week missions planned and two months missions planned I I would think that this is already the time that you would you would need to have the similar design. Mm. Uh, what we what we focus on before maybe uh, was uh, how to adapt a habitat to the needs of a person that has special needs. In fact, because we had a participant that uh, was blind and uh, did not have one hand, so we made sure. During the mission, actually, we were getting feedback from that person on what improvements could be made. You know, small stuff like, uh, I don't know, sharp edge here or there, or the floor a little bit higher or lower here or there. But these are more um, like ergonomic uh, things that you could also learn from everyday life. But okay. this kind of feedback coming from a person that's already in the habitat was more specific to the, the habitat design. Okay, that's very. I mean, that's a very interesting point because that sort of relates quite directly to the goal of many analogs for space, space agencies, which lets them try out a design that is very representative of their real mission. And they can say, well, if we have this, if we were to put this exact thing on the moon, how would it mm. perform? Um, so that's a very interesting point. And I think... I will, I'm going to actually move that over to human factors for now because I think we'll, we'll, we can loop back to that for sure. Um, but if does anyone else have any further points? Um, I've mentioned I've, about this, and then we'll go over to human factors. That's been quite a natural natural evolution across there. Um, I put down crew size. Um, people have different. Obviously, there's different, very differences. Um, many people go with six as the standard size. Amity is bigger. Amity has more i think six astronauts still if i'm correct but yeah, has more six, six analog astronauts plus two backups yeah but then, but then a much larger support crew on site um of course and then now nasa are looking more at doing four for many of their lunar operations does anyone have any thoughts about how crew size or sort of selection of crew size or maybe rather than the size itself has this impact on the habitat if there's any changes about how people would interact with it um if you had a crew that was 10 people, would you need substantially different designs versus just having having the usual six or, or, or four? I think it has to do a lot with privacy, that uh, you have a, an option to retreat somewhere. Okay. That's interesting because we, we've... I've got and of course, yeah. um, 
crew size also depends on which how many experiments you have to run yeah how many um uh, hours of work you put into a mission so do you need two people to cover the workload or do you need 12 people to cover the workload um with uh with amade um there is also a limitation uh, due to the the number of uh, spacesuits available because they have this really advanced spacesuit simulators mm. um, and of course they can't uh, be bought off the shelf they have to be built and uh, the, a lot of technology goes into these suits um, so it's also a cost factor okay that's a very, that's a, I think a very good point and probably a, a fairly big reason that many habitats don't, I think I'm suspect the cost is the reason that many habitats don't go bigger because you make it 12 people, it doubles all, it at least doubles all the costs, probably more than that because you're paying for more. More than, more than, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, in that case, actually, as a sort of question to sort of loop round to, for people who run missions, would you have preferred having more crew even if it meant not necessarily having more of that, as you say, sort of advanced equipment, as it were. So, if, so for Amadi, if you had ten crew but still only two spacesuits, so four crew members are working almost entirely inside the habitat on experiments that aren't surface related, would you have found that a useful tool for you, or do you, would you have have you would you rule it out as a as a useful thing to do? Um. Well. <sighs> There is a number of things to consider when you make the crew bigger. First of all, you have to make the habitat big, bigger because they all need to be accommodated. They have to sleep somewhere. They have they need a workplace. Um, they need a place where they can eat. So every every person you add um, makes the habitat construction um, changes the habitat construction. It's also, um, yeah, I mean, the people have to be transported and, and uh, for example, in the Amadi 20, we had a lot of, of uh, runs between the, um, the, the habitat and the site of the experiment. Yeah, they were using um, quads and kind of beach buggy, uh, like um, things, and again, this this when you have more more crew, you have to have more vehicles involved. It again, it's it makes operations more complex. You need more parking space. You need to coordinate extra vehicles, uh, maintain the vehicles. So yeah, you you get more work done, but you also have more costs, and then of course. Um, if you decide for a crew size, then yeah, it's it limits in a way the number of experiments you can do or the complexity of experiments you can do. But it, it's a trade-off. Like in, in normal business, I mean, would you like to employ another five people in your company to yeah. get uh, to get the workload of some people, or or would you not? No. That's very that's very good. That's very useful to talk about, I think. And that's the, the, the logistics cost. I yeah. think something that we can definitely discuss moving forwards. Um, yeah. Anything else on this point? I mentioned unique aspects um, with the hope that we'd have someone from Chill Ice here to talk about that or someone from Hydronauts um, mm. looking at the advantages of having or sort of the trade-offs about having a base that's got um, one or a number of very unique things. Um, another one would be something like, I think it was, I forget which Amity mission where it actually relocated base, where the base moved site. Um, halfway through the mission as, as an experiment. Does anyone have any sort of, I think this will be fairly brief because no one, I don't think anyone's got that much um, skin in the game for something like that, but does anyone have any thoughts about habitats that have this very sort of single focus around underwater operations, lava tubes, anything like that that they want to want to bring up before we move on? Yeah, to I mean, if, human if you're talking about underwater missions, um, <laughs> there are a lot of technical limitations as well. Uh, in, in terms of what you can, how you can design uh, your your habitat, yeah, it, yeah. there is a, an enormous amount of pressure from the water, 
so um yeah that that limits um that limits your your options for the design and also yeah the, it's, it's yet more expensive to construct underwater designs so the bigger they get the more the cost will rise exponentially hmm. so of course Equally, some of the natural habitats uh, that are around, whether it's like lava tube, um, 10,000 feet up a mountain in the middle of the desert, um, as apart from the logistics problems of getting things to there, supporting it and back and everything else, at least you're not trying to simulate the actual environment inside, like if you're in an aircraft hangar or a building in the middle of Europe. Um, whereas if you are you know, high up a mountain or in somewhere very humid, very hot, very dry, um, that, uh, you can orientate. That's a unique aspect that is a positive, in my view. <laughs> okay, so that yeah. you, you, as so that sort of adds environmental stress, almost. Yeah. Would, would that be a word for it, Alan? Do you think, or is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Environmental stress and, and um, just unique features of each site and group. That's interesting. That's a very good point. Okay. Does anyone else have any further points um, about mission design? We can come back to it later if we do. Yes, um, definitely. Um, I would add two, uh, yet two sub boxes there. Um, the crew size, it's on. <clears throat> we are only thinking about the analog astronauts. That's a very good point. Six, but we have like hundreds of mission support people. Uh, of people in, in IT support who handle the, the data uh, from the experiments um, and the connectivity between um, the support and, and the mission. We have the medical team. Um, <clears throat> we have flight planning, of course. We have flight, flight control. Um, we have the, the procedures people. We have the science support. We have the records uh, people. And they're, they're just as important to the, to the mission and a, a lot more, and yet uh, everybody is just worried about how many astronauts are there. That's a very good point, and thank thank you. I, I that's something I've definitely sort of overlooked in the, in much of this because we're talking more about the habitat. But that's a very very good point to bring up um, about about, and I think impacts a lot of things, including like um, like duration, especially because that's a real limit to having a a sort of. I, I don't. I think Amity would have difficulties running a three-month mission because of the the sheer size of the staff involved, um, which may ref be more reflective of how a real space mission operates, where you start to really get into these issues with scheduling and, and staff availability. Whereas something like MDRS, where they've only got a, a sort of small handful of staff on site, they can run missions much longer because they have less of this overhead. Yeah, and it's also. I mean the. The people in in Amadi, most of them, except three of them, are actually volunteers. Mm. So we all have jobs, yeah. and we can't take unlimited time off work. So, Karen, you mentioned there were two points that you were going to make. Yes, the, the, the other first... point I would definitely add is finance. Your mission yes. design is very, very much depending on the finance you can get for the mission. And I think that may be a future theme for a, for another workshop at the next conference, I suspect. Um, because that's I think I think that kind of underpins almost everything here. Um, um, yeah. and, how, and how that operates and how to do good trade-offs that way. So um, I, I, I'm sort of, I sort of want to talk about it, but also kind of want to leave that as a thing to talk about later. Almost. But you're, you're very right. And I think we should we should especially in things like architecture, which we'll come on to as we work our way around, sort of impacts everything is in architecture because you can do the whole 3D printed aluminium nonsense if you want, but it costs a huge amount. So, so that's a very important yeah. factor that sort of underlies, underpins the whole thing. So does anyone else have any, any things they'd like to bring up about mission design and its sort of impact on habitat? No, other way, yeah, mission design is impact on habitat, um, habitat design operations. Um, before we move around to human factors. But I think we've got a lot of good discussion so far. Well done, Sam. Chat, anything else in the chat? Um, okay. Um, I think 
think that's all we've got in here so far. Um, nothing in the chat that we've got. So in that case, we'll move our way around anti-clockwise to human factors. Um, and really try and sort of dive now in a little bit deeper to how human factors impacts the design, how the design needs to respect human factors, or in cases doesn't, um, which is, I think, interesting and a point that often is sort of occasionally you see in, in post-mission reports. Um, and what sort of people feel, and I think interesting, given we have a, a staff, a sort of group of mostly people who are people who have worked on mission planning rather than as astronauts, um, or people who haven't um, done sort of longer duration isolation, it would be interesting to hear some opinions about how personal space impacts a mission and how it impacts the habitat and how the habitat should reflect that. Um, i trying to think who I can pull up here. I mean, Alan, you've, you've got experience with, with, I guess, this is sort of, with, this is your, your relevant field. Um, not necessarily to, to do directly with analogs, but it's still a very relevant thing. So have you got any thoughts about how, how this might impact things? Um, yeah, it, it seems bizarre, almost crazy uh, to think that it is a very, very common human thing and an engineering thing, uh, that when you get somebody designing something, um, on the one hand, you want the freedom uh, and the updating as technologies and techniques change, but it's never ceased to amaze me. Uh, and it isn't just young engineers, but typically it's people that are in the early parts of design of their career and then designing things where they don't always see the, the bigger picture, if you like, or the full aspect of the human factors interface, particularly uh, with human beings making things work or touch things, switch things, operate things. Um, a simple example, I, I, I had to sort of guide some people that were doing a design and it, and it was lovely for the actual technical side of how this thing worked. Uh, but what had been completely missed, and this was in uh, on, on earth level stuff, but it would have the same sort of thing for space. You imagine working something inside, when you're in a space suit and you've got uh, limited um, mobility and your hands, you might have really big thick gloves. Uh, in my case, um, heaven forbid, it ever happens but when you're looking at all this nasty things that people do to each other in warfare and that but you might have to wear um things that protect you so that the designers have totally missed the fact that you've got like cotton under gloves and then rubber outer gloves <laughs> uh, and maybe goggles on that you can't see that well so thinking of that aspect but when you're sat in a, a nice little warm design room uh, and or and somebody hasn't told you those aspects or made you aware I mean, it was in this in this spec specification, but it's so easy to miss, and it's easy looking back or when you've seen these things. But it's areas like that. I think we could help um, put out guidelines or have discussions where you make people aware of that sort of thing and try and help give solutions. Um, you know, there is no one size fits all, but it's the overall aspect of making sure that if you designing something, that don't make it very weak or small, or you know, make it easy. Um, something Karen said as well, which I hadn't thought of before, that um, I think it's great that at least one group, if not many, uh, have used, uh, so it was uh, Morgajata, um, sorry, I'm probably, probably saying it wrong. Um, if somebody's like blind or in a wheelchair or hasn't got a hand, some folks might say, well, why are you even letting them go on a mission? But heaven forbid, if you're sending somebody all the way to the moon or Mars, particularly Mars, um, the time's going to get them back. You wouldn't want anything to happen to people but let's say they lost a hand in an accident or became blinded and there's lots of aspects where that could happen if you've designed the thing so that they can then be used when you've got that disability um or that human change in in your body's ability to do things everybody would benefit and you wouldn't preclude that person that's maybe on mars and that hasn't got a hand or can't see from doing lots of productive work so it's not so, that's something i hadn't quite seen it that way and I'm glad that that's as at least as on one or two missions that that's being looked at um but yeah that's that's my input for now <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, very I, good. I think that really helps you helps you focus on good ergonomic design anyway if you consider all those uh impairments and disabilities mm -hmm. it does help you really focus in on even the smallest of issue 
Yeah, and and uh, I mean, even if I'm, I'm, I'm always struggling with the word disability because <laughs> people are so different. Mm. Able. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> we all have abilities and disabilities in some areas. Um, for example, if you have no legs, is that a hindrance for going on the International Space Station? You don't have to walk. Yeah. Yeah. It's not not a, a problem. Um, even if we think about missions to Mars. Somebody who is in on the spectrum with autism, they might they might be able to cope with the isolation a, a lot better than so-called normal people. Totally agree. Yes, yeah, so I, I I dislike the disability thing. I only used it as more colloquial. Uh, Dif differences in able. differences in yeah. human beings. Differently <laughs> able. Differently positives. able people. Everybody has abilities and disabilities in in certain areas. So. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Although I, you'll, you'll forgive me for writing disabilities on the notes because it's a lot easier to write. Yeah. Yeah, but I think well, that's, that's we'll a very make that a discussion point. for another time. Yes. <laughs> Let's see what we can come up with. Yeah. 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 Um, another factor that I I sometimes see missing, it's that. Um, habitat design, spacecraft design, whatever, it's it focused very much on engineering and on the technical aspects that it's functioning well. But people are not, we're not here to function, we're here to live. Yeah. So um, we will need a museum on Mars, we will probably need a concert hall or something like this, even if it's just virtual. But every culture on Earth for tens of thousands of years have created art. Uh, they have created some music, some painting, some whatever, some sculpturing. And uh, it is in us as humans. So we have to ensure that, that it's not only functioning, but that it's nice and livable. And that people cannot be just um <clears throat> surviving but striving they're not just not unhappy but they're very happy excellent excellent points yeah, yeah. Totally agree. yes i'm excited to hear that and actually i think it is it is it is an amazing point uh, to to make and i think it could be it could be really nice if we could maybe include some form of art expression in the schedules of analog astronauts, just yeah, as another project. As I think of it, um, we usually don't give them much free time anyway, because they need to do so many things around the habitat. And yeah, as you said, engineering stuff, maintenance stuff, experiments, all of that. And still some time to express themselves artistically. That, that would be, for me, that would be an exciting addition to the schedule. And we see it on the ISS. They are always um, <clears throat> they're always doing something artsy. Some are, a lot of astronauts are actually painting. Um, the Chris Hatfield with his singing <laughs> Space yeah. Odyssey from the ISS, and and um, Alexei Leonov, who was the first uh, person to create an artwork in space. Mm. Yeah. You know? It's it's always been kind of um, it, it's part of our being human that yeah. we have the necessity to create some form of art and to surround us with arts. We listen we listen to music. We we look at paintings yeah. and sculptures. So um, we write poetry or we read it. So um, yeah. Well, it's it's, like it seems like almost every ISS crew has a musician on board now, which is very nice to see. Yeah. Um, which is, it's, it's a sort of, it's, I don't, I don't, I wonder if it's a, if it's actually the case that they were all musicians going back to the sort of 60s and 70s and they just didn't want to do it because it was sort of too military focus and now it's sort of come out or if it's actually changed the culture about how yeah. you do selection. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Michael Collins was pretty artsy. Mm. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it may, it may be that the culture has changed to reflect the importance yeah. of it, but the astronauts are sort of the same people. Yeah. Okay, that's very good. Have we got any, any more discussions about that before we sort of we can dive into? It? I think personal space was mentioned already as a 
as a discussion point. So we can dive into that in a second. But does anyone have any more points about the astronauts, sort of differently abled astronauts, or sort of giving people creative creative space um, before we go into personal space as a as a topic? Well, I'm, I, I, I just can corroborate what was said before that the things that are perceived as disabilities in one environment can be perceived as um, advantages in another environment. So the example with a person that does not have legs is one of those examples. That person would have less fluid shift in their body, would have smaller oxygen consumption and there are lots of advantages for a person who doesn't have legs in space so that's just one of those examples when it comes to uh, uh, psychological uh, or so neuroatypical uh, things i'm uh, i'm not uh, uh, sure yet how to tackle this because some of those we could imagine that would be beneficial, but I, I don't think we, we can accommodate for all of those at this point. Would you say it's, it's difficult to, would you say that's because of the uh, sort of lack of a framework to work within or just because of like- it's, No, it's... I, think, I think some uh, uh, mm. Autism is a, is a difficult thing to discuss. Uh, autism was mentioned maybe as one of the, uh, I, I don't know, conditions or uh, states of being. I don't know how to, how to uh, mm. express that in, in English uh, best, but uh, that could maybe help a person um, if they don't need that much, I don't know, interaction or they enjoy isolation. Yes and no, because you know this environment is is noisy. This environment can be high pressure, and this environment includes people a little bit, you no, know, uh, crammed right over, crowded over each other. So maybe, and also autism is a wide spectrum. So you can imagine that some things would be uh, easier for some of the people on the spectrum than the others. So uh, that's, to me, this is much more difficult and challenging to include the, this kind of um, atypicality, let's say, than the physical ones. That's a very... In planning. Point. Yeah. And also when you're looking for a crew, you're looking for a team of people who are stable. So you do uh, examine, right, if, if they are before sending anybody on the mission. So that's also another thing. There are a lot of people who are brilliant, but who um, are very vulnerable or, you know, have their sensitivities and this this is also this is also something that that could be that could be challenging yeah and if we wanted to accommodate for that we would probably need to include a psychological crew maybe mm. yeah that's a very very good point. rather rather yeah. than the habitat uh, uh, design although although i think karen said before that this is a place to live as well and we know that this has such a huge impact on how people feel the environment that they are in so i heard before that maybe including some natural looking materials in the design is a way to go for example maybe a little bit of wood even though it's not super practical could be mood enhancing yeah. for people who are actually locked into something that's super artificial and so far away from our daily earth experience yeah that's, very, that's a very interesting point, actually, because um, looking at plans for Mars 500 and that facility in, in Moscow, that's really, really strongly wood panelled, which I, I found very surprising as a thing because it's, it's so different to the NASA analogs, which are very ISS-like. And I wonder if that was a, a deliberate choice from the, the designers there to make it more sort of domestic as a, as a facility rather than being so sort of clinical. That's a very, very mm. good point. 
I forget the name of the, of the base that they did Master 500 in, but it's the, the, the big indoor facility in Moscow with the, with the cylindrical um, uh, structure. So that's a very good point. Um, we mentioned previously about privacy and personal space. Um, do, should we have a little bit more discussion about that? Because it's a very interesting point about how much it's needed and wanted and planned for. Um, because different missions do it very differently. So, so um, I know Lunaris has relatively small, you have sort of sleeping pods, which are a bit more like a sort of yeah, a sleeping pod, quite literally. Um, and uh, places like Hayseas and MDRS have relatively small individual rooms, um, longer duration. Mars 500 has actually surprisingly big rooms that uh, as, an, as a student, I'd be quite happy to live in this for quite a long time. Um, in my experience. So I, I wonder what people think about that um, or having having sort of communal private space where you've got a, a room that you can go into and, and have as a private space, but it's not necessarily yours versus having your own bedroom. Um, what, what do people think about this and the importance of this for, for crews? I think... Um the size of the sleeping quarters is not necessarily that important because when you sleep, you sleep. Oh, you don't realize that uh, you have uh, um, people sleeping in beds next to you or in pods next to you. Um, yeah, because you, you're gone. <laughs> um, yeah, <clears throat> I think it's more important when it comes to bathrooms. Yeah, that you can have some some privacy there um, or you just have the option to yeah to create your own space if you don't want to socialize for <laughs> for a certain amount of time that and that can also be done virtually yeah you can I mean people nowadays create their private private space by just staring at their mobile and totally ignoring the people around them you know, we see it even in restaurants. People don't uh, <laughs> interact with each other. People sitting at one table, but each of them is staring at their own phone sometimes. Mm. So yeah. that is, they are creating some privacy for themselves, whether that is good or bad. I don't <laughs> want to judge. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not diving to the... I mean, point. It's, yeah. it can be as easy as putting on VR goggles. Yeah. Um, to totally uh, exclude you from the space, from the physical space around you. Um, so uh, it's. Uh, I'm not saying I have a, a, a solution for this issue. Um, I'm just saying it's it's important to consider. That's a very good point. Anyone else have any any opinions on on privacy for, for astronauts? um about how it might be important um i can i can relay something eleanor found on her on uh Slippy Oz one if that'd be interesting if, if no one's got i think and i can re relay it probably probably badly but i can there's an interesting alternative take which might be interesting um which is that as mission commander her point of view is you actually want little privacy um or as little as possible because it means that you can monitor crew performance a lot better um and for a mission that was much more, had fewer EVAs and was more based around inside the inside the habitat, um, her view as commander, and it's maybe different to what the rest of the crew think, which is an interesting an interesting question, was that having being able to monitor everyone else's monitor everyone else's mood um, was a very important thing from the point of view of sort of having this uh, control over over the outcomes of the mission. Um, be interested to hear what people if anyone has any experience of how it works in practice or different opinions i think it differs a bit if we're talking experiments yeah also in amadi 20 the, the analog astronauts were wearing sensors um watching their whereabouts but they were anonymized so they would just take a tag with a random number they would keep that number throughout the mission, but we would not know who is astronaut number four. But we would track astronaut number four's movement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but that was part of an experiment. 
I think that's very different because they, of course, they are informed about the procedures, they sign an informed consent, it's passed through an ethical committee. Um, but what do we do if we travel to, to Mars? Yeah. Do we want um, the mission commander uh, to, to be aware of, of the mood and, and, uh, and whereabouts of every single person on the mission? Because in this case, they're not a such part of an experiment where we want to see uh, where they're going and what they're doing and what is their mood, but they're actually yeah, we're traveling somewhere. Mm. That's a good point. Anyone have any other any other things to add from that, or, or any other questions about privacy or, or personal space that we could include? I think it's been mentioned by a few people that obviously it varies mission to mission. The the makeup of the crew, you know, how do they actually know each other beforehand or not? Because that can be positive or no, maybe not but it's certainly the crew makeup and length of mission um but i think the idea of having a uh, personal space to retreat to if you like as karen said even if and it's vr goggles or looking at your own phone and, and putting your headphones in or on um or just ignoring other noises but the, the ability to have that um space to retreat to as it were uh, i think is the thing that needs to be looked at for each mission and it is very important that's a good summary okay so we've got that noted down um any other questions zooming out a little bit to human factors as a whole um i've put down sort of environmental um state and furniture as sort of a few um sort of prompts i don't know if there's any discussion we can have i'm sure the architects in 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 the actual base are going to absolute town on those. Um, so if anyone, I don't know if anyone's got any particular things they want to mention about those, or if we can move around to to um to architecture. So in Amade 20, we did some heat maps, like tracking where people would gather most of the time, where, we, where they would spend most of the time. And uh, surprise, surprise, it was in the kitchen and slash dining area. <laughs> Like on Earth, yeah, <laughs> people surprise. gathered around where the food is. That's very nice. Yeah. Well, where the food was consumed. Yeah, where well, so, yeah, preparation, consuming, sharing, it, it's very common, as you say. It shows yeah. that human aspect wherever you are on Mars or in, mm -hmm. in your own house or at work. Yeah, it's actually an interesting point because that, that may be very useful in saying that if you want to prioritize making one space of the, of the base as nice as you can, make that the kitchen yes. or the dining room. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Agreed. That's a very good point. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I will just check with anyone else in the chat. Stefan, um, Nithya, do you want, if you've got any, any, um, anything to add, just pop it in the chat because I know you've got, you can't use your microphone right now. So feel free to just, um, just type that and I'll, I'll read it out for you. Um, Stefan, have you got any, any more opinions on this sort of thing? Just to make sure that everyone's got representation. I would say there was there would be also some difference between a team of two or four, uh, four of, of six compared to a team of 10. I think um, a team of 10 will, will differ from the crew in, in, for the, for the uh, intention among the crew. We are not, uh, because for if you are on, on a team of four, you are a very small team. So you interact with each other. You cannot be split in two groups. With the six, uh, so we, are, we still have a small group, but with 10, you can, can, you can have also some uh, split of the crew and the interaction with, could differ also, so I think. That's a very good point. That's a very interesting point actually. So you, you need to have almost different spaces the different groups can meet within simultaneously. No, that would also dictate the type of mission that you could do. Um, yeah, the number of the crew. That's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan, let me just check. Okay. Nithya has not added anything to chat. If you do add anything later on, just I'll add it. I'll go back and add it. No problem. Um, that's really great. This is going to look quite fleshed out. So that's encouraging. Um, let's move around now to 
architecture um, as a point, which is a uh, sort of, I think we sort of keep keep bouncing around architecture. And this is sort of obviously very similar to human factors. Um, I've laid this out more as a, a kind of high level architecture. So sort of looking at the layout of the base as a whole and how that's split up. Um, and how, how that could work. So we're interested to see if, if we've got any, if there's any particular thoughts on that um, about what's important and, and sort of what what you've seen in the past that's been done done well or done badly. Yeah, I think that's it's it's an area that uh, where the sharing uh, of ideas and practices uh, and what has uh, been designed and then put into place and then used uh, and uh, and what worked well and what didn't uh, and it's not a massively budget oriented thing or, or even crew and support staff size but um, this is where these sorts of forums and the whole idea of uh, the analog um, missions um, workshops uh, and chasms uh, raison d'etre if you like um, as, as, as well as other uh, other groups um, but yeah because like floor plan for instance you know well laid out where you're not sort of crossing the same space I mean it's a well-known thing for kitchens <laughs> get back to kitchens again but it's true um you wouldn't want it so that you've got the implements here and the the, the cooker there and the, and the crockery there and, and something else and that you're having to keep moving across uh, you'll always have some movement you can't make it zero but you can minimize the wasted time and, and walking around unless it's a thing that's deemed to be <laughs> a good activity but in the main it's trying to make that ergonomic sensible and human based rather than forcing the humans to fit into the uh, what somebody else thinks is a good design and sharing that knowledge about, around people uh, can help uh, it doesn't matter what their uh, literal situation in in the habitat and the budget and the, and the number of people there's still ideas that you, you can help not help prevent doing the same bad design thing for somebody else and, and share the good news uh, good uh, aspects That's a very good point. I'll try and make that in the notes. Awesome. Um, I think you've summarized the whole point there, the whole field there, Alan. <laughs> the good work. Um, uh, what else we got? Um, division of space I put down as, a, as something to, um, to discuss about how the space is divided between different uses. And I think something that varies a huge amount between habitats, um, looking at places like MDRS and high seas, which sort of only really have one, 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 maybe one room or two rooms between two levels, um, versus uh, Lunaris, which is much more broken up into different rooms um, with different functions. So I'd be interested just to, to see what people think about the benefits of each of those things. Um, if there's a benefit to having a sort of studio flat almost where you've got your sort of sleeping space is just off from the workspace versus having um upstairs is living upstairs is sort of living downstairs is working or anything like that yeah that's a good point i mean i i from experience and plus my own personal view uh would agree with karen that uh that the sleeping uh course is part whether it's in 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 you in, in know mixed room as you say like a bed sits of idea or separate sleeping quarters but the size of it and the style of it within reason shouldn't matter now that that's what i would think and that's what i've observed but it'd be interesting to hear from the actual people that go on the different missions and and those variations as you say from quite uh, i won't say palatial but bigger than a student's <laughs> <laughs> typically through, through to literally like the japanese style pod that's literally just about enough room to crawl into and sleep now, I wouldn't have thought it would be important, but uh, it make much difference. But psychologically and the literal sleep and the patterns, it'd be interesting to hear what people's actual experience is or what the um, uh, analog astronauts, as it were, that they have uh, attendees, what they actually think and, and their observations. That's a very good point as well. Um, I don't, I, like I don't know, but I was just thinking when, yeah, Alan, when you were talking about your personal preferences, um, is that a selection criteria that somebody can sleep anywhere, then no matter if it's light or dark, no matter how noisy it is? 
Um, well, we all, as you said, all human beings vary. Um, it's good if you can do that, but I'm, I'm not sure. I've, over the years, um, probably a few thousand people, I'm, I'm absolutely mad. I've, I had a reputation of being able to sleep absolutely anywhere, you know, with the maximum light noise or anything, but I, I'm not unique, but I, I think I'm in the small percentile <laughs> of human beings. Um, but yeah, so for me, it, yeah. it's, it's not a big thing, but for others, it, it could be huge. And hence why I, I think it'd be good to have some discussion about what we think won't matter and would matter and would be best to what people actually um, themselves humanly feel uh, and what the spread is as well across the different uh, habitat attendees. Yeah, I mean, I can fall asleep on a in the middle of a dance floor in a discotheque or on a, a construction site. It doesn't bother me at all if there is noise, if there is light. I can fall asleep on the water if I'm on in the in the sea. Um, I lay on my back and I let myself drift and I can fall asleep in the water. Be an interesting survey to see um, without getting too deep initially, uh, just a, a quick straw poll type simple survey across um, all current and previous um, attenders of, of the HABs around the world. Um, what their view of that is, you know, do they sleep easily or not? Um, and it, it, what's the more normal? Is there a complete sort of distribution that's fairly normal distribution sort of thing uh, for those that can take the light, the noise and, and the environment doesn't matter and others that you know, they need that quietness or they need the separation. Uh, Sam said there's variations in types of accommodation. It'd be interesting to get a, a, a simple survey to start with. It'd probably lead into a complete um, discussion if not a com complete conference, I don't know, but certainly be interesting to hear the initial um, thoughts of people. Yeah, that's a, an interesting idea. We could actually a very good point. Start doing that. <laughs> yeah, we're in the right place for it because through Casm we've got a lot, we've got enough data we can talk to restaurants about it. So yeah, that, that's definitely a point to bring up in the when we summarise this at the end of the session because we we're gonna at the end of this we're gonna um go back on a call with the people who've been in person. We'll we'll swap notes. So we'll bring that up as one of the key points um that we can mention to. To, um, to them is something that would be interesting to follow up on. Let's do a CASM survey. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Yeah, yeah excellent. Awesome, okay. That's a good takeaway from architecture. We, has anyone got any other points? But if not, that's a very good sort of point to end on as a, as a conclusion. <laughs> um, I put down room size. Um, that sort of relates back to the same thing about um, having sort of split multi-purpose spaces versus having um a larger one so again mdrs and high seas have these very large um circular uh, floor plans whereas lunaris or um, mars 500 have much more of this split yeah some yeah of that i would also... sorry. sorry karen first <laughs> um i would also say if we are talking high fidelity missions would we do high fidelity architecture i.e would we start 3, 3D printing from uh, regu regulars um, um, like material? Because now the habitats we're constructing, we're constructing with the materials we have readily available on Earth and prefabricated mm -hmm. uh, modules. And uh, if, if we want to do um, a very high fid fidelity mission, <laughs> wouldn't we? Uh, also construct the habitat in a way that uh, that we would construct it on Mars, let's yeah. say. That's exactly what they've done at Johnson with the 3D printed habitat from Icon. Um, I think it's here. It might be a different one. There's there's a number of them. They've got their big 3D printed, um, quite boxy, quite boxy one, which has been, I think he's currently active, as far as I'm aware, um, as a facility there. So that's a very good point. Hmm. Again, it's without... To, to like um, going around the same sort of things or, or making this too broad or too in-depth um, as lots of other subject areas have, have covered uh, a lot of it will be driven by the financial um, backing and ability and the team size and everything so some things it's like if, if you on the water side it depends on the mission um, well the, the funding the, the background the mission the people the location everything else so for instance, if somewhere where 
they can't afford or haven't got the ability um, to try and simulate. And we don't need to simulate everything on every mission. So one mission might have um, piped water onto the actual site if it happens to be right next to a, a building. Um, but if that, if you're doing, uh, say, like a, somebody raised um, the biological or the hydroponics, aquaponics, any of the sort of food and production side that might be longer term, if, if the main thing is looking at that side of things, you're only trying to see for six months or a year uh, how do things grow or, or in what sort of environments and the amount of light, the amount of That, that that can be the main mission sort of driver uh, mm -hmm. because not everybody in every mission in every hab has to do all of the things in my humble opinion <laughs> that's a very good point yeah and um, i have also another um point uh, relating to the division of space um i think you can't you cannot only divide a space physically or like by actually <laughs> dividing the space by putting divisions in there but you can for example divide a space between day and night with different colored lighting uh, you can put some background music to make a totally different space yeah in the evening the work the workspace that was very well illuminated during the day to enable people to see what they're doing and was very quiet uh, in the evening that can, can become a zone of like very warm uh, background lighting and some some background music or something like that um, um, we have to also think about different methods to di divide uh, a room that's, that's a very good point yeah and that's a good thing to share because i'm sure a lot of people maybe haven't thought of that or don't yeah. include that in their design and thoughts of the whole um, hab and how it's used and how you could use the same space as you say for work stuff one part of the day and a um, bit more restful or social interaction and yeah. everything at another time mm. changing all the put sound a nice the table, put a nice tablecloth over the desk in the evening so you don't see the work the work mm. uh, bit of it <laughs> that's a good point yeah even that yeah. that would make a big psychological effect yeah yeah so almost having it be not reconfigurable is the wrong word but having it with or you can change easily the decorations yeah yeah and ambiente that you have the changing yeah. light changing uh, sounds changing maybe even changing smells yeah we can put some people use uh, use um these um perfume candles on earth so why not on in space that's a nice idea. Yeah, uh, and it just does have an effect on the human psychology. There's certain smells. That sometimes, yeah. something, I think the world knows about some, but others, it's we're still working out why. Don't always understand why a certain, um, almost a woody burning sort of smell can make people relax. It probably goes back to Stone Age when you're in a cave and when you yeah. smell the wood, you know you're in safety. I, we don't know yeah. always. Some are well known and others we're, we're still experimenting. But yeah, great, uh, mm. great point, Karen. Yeah. I know someone who um who had a they were it's a almost I don't know how you describe it almost sort of um hacking their own memory why whenever they were going to an event they wanted to remember in the future so like a concert they'd buy a new perfume and then only use it for that event so then if they wanted to remember that event very strongly they'd then smell the perfume and they'd associate that very strongly with the with the memory which is a really it's sort of like <laughs> that, that feels really wrong in yeah, some ways to sort of hack your own memory that way but it's really really smart yeah that's it, a good idea yeah it, it does work for example when you study for exams yeah so you can always have if you have a sort of um if you had a a working smell and a, and a socializing smell you can have crews not want to work or socialize in different times by just switching the smell between between the two of them yeah that's a really interesting point mm -hmm. and that'd be really interesting you could you could measure that i think quite easily as well uh, it's yeah. quite a good experiment to run between different habitats because you can you almost don't you don't want to control for for the structure space itself you want to control for people's behaviors so you could run that's a very good point yeah so we should use really all of our senses mm. um, to 
yeah. but or address all senses if we talk about um, creating um, different spaces it doesn't have to be like like a, a different room it can be something different within the room and there is lot of lots of studies on that like with music and smells in in uh, for example in shops yeah how it yeah. how it influences people to to buy more when a certain kind of music is is uh, playing or a certain usually they they uh even if they don't have a bakery they sometimes produce artificial smell mm. of freshly baked bread that <laughs> um, makes you hungry and then you buy more food yeah that's a very good point so there are lots of studies on on these things how 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 smells sounds colors lighting affects our our behavior mm. whilst we wouldn't necessarily want to be uh, selling lots of stuff to, <laughs> to astronauts but the, the, yeah, but, the, but the <laughs> point now but you're right the point of how that affects our human feelings uh, we yeah. could use that to help positively um try out things in the different habs and see what work, you know works best and what doesn't and how these things affect yeah. as you say yeah, because they do it in the commercial world so why not use that research uh, at least as a starting point to say oh how can we positively use that in in the habs yeah. with a view for long term in mars yeah, that's good well done yeah. and i think i think it's getting more common with color changing lights i think is, is i know lunaris has a, a full led controllable system so i know they're doing that i don't know about sort of soundscape and so on but that's very interesting yeah, especially if they can find the, the off switch. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No, the, the thing is, it's just when we really go to Mars, we have such limited resources. The, the little we have, we have to use 150%. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. we cannot, uh, we cannot um, afford leaving things aside and not using certain yeah. resources. Yeah. That's really good. That's really good. Really good point from there is that that's the middle thing. Okay, let's move on. From, I think, and does anyone else have any more general architecture um, points to bring up um, to do with other parts of architecture and and things that could be related to it away from this sort of discussion? And then we'll move on to the last of the four points. No, let's go check the chat. See if anyone's put anything there. No. Okay. Awesome. Um, in that case, we'll go on to the last of the four discussion points, then we'll try and wrap up each one. Um, and this is, I call it technical, which is a bit of a, a poor word. I think facilities might be a better thing to call it. And this is just talking about the um, the equipment you have in the habitat or the, the systems or, or anything like that. Um, and I put some sort of very brief examples about um, what that could be and, and how it's managed. Um, but obviously, there's a very there's a huge range of things that could be covered here. Um, about what's important to include in the habitat, um, what's important to consider when you're doing sort of an early design or an advanced design or maybe retrofitting an old structure to a new purpose. Um, you know, is it important to have a realistic power system, um, both for the simulation, but also for the, the safety of the crew? Um, lots of the habitats just use a diesel generator on site, which is, has advantages, but also has some disadvantages. Um, logistics, it kind of falls a lot of it is under the sort of administration of the habitat but also there's some points i know karen you mentioned about having transports of astronauts to experiment sites um also as well as that, having storage being usable and then experimental facilities so having as well as the specific experiments you're running having things like a workshop to do repairs or a generic lab to do um to allow sort of experiments opportunity things like that just to sort of um round up the discussion about design to include some of these facilities almost so does anyone have any anything they'd like to like to immediately throw on the table about this this field um from the amade mission again <laughs> um power systems we need we needed a lot of charging of charging uh rovers charging batteries for certain experiments in between the experiment runs so uh, where do you put the charging station how do you monitor it because it's obviously also a risk um, charging stations can uh, can uh, malfunction which can in worst case for example lead 
to a fire. So they can't be entirely left alone. They probably, we don't probably want to have them too close to the sleeping quarters um, or to any other um, um, parts of the habitat. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it also needs scheduling. Who is, who is, uh, who is charging what when? Mm. What can be left to charge to be charged overnight? What has to be charged during the day? Because uh, it can only run for three hours, and then you want to do another experiment run in the afternoon, and you have to recharge it during lunch break. Then you get into planning difficulties with the people who are supposed to actually eat lunch during the lunch break. <laughs> um, so there is a lot to consider there. It seems easy. Um, but it's uh, it can be quite complex depending on the experiments you run. If you do psychological mm -hmm. experiments, you don't have so many issues. But if you if you run rovers, you fly drones, etc., um, they uh, they basically need permanent uh, recharging, battery changing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is also time consuming mm -hmm. for the astronauts. That's a very good point. Yeah, agree with all of that. Yeah, we can learn a lot from um, industry. Um, mm. We don't have to take everything, but there's a lot that we don't need to reinvent the wheel in a lot of areas. And I think, again, um, it's not just um, constrained by budget and the types of people that are on the support side, whether it's volunteers or fully paid and funded uh, and the size. But and again, we don't want to make it too restrictive. But I think there's an area, this is an area, the logistics support side and the planning. I think it's, some, it's done well in some areas and not so well in others. And most of that isn't by arrogance, it's more ignorance, as in ignorance of not knowing some of the better techniques or not seeing those hidden things like proposing something like even a tablet, um, as in like a smartphone type um, iPad type tablet, uh, right through to vehicles and that. As Karen said, the charging and the maintenance and support and the danger because you can get heat or explosion and you want to keep those away from people and anything else um, flammable or volatile. Um, but sharing this side of things, it, perhaps having a either a mini conference or at least even some simple guidelines that you can put out to say, have you thought of this or do you want any help on, in these sorts of areas? The logistic support side, as I think Karen and myself both agree, it could be 100 to 200 people. I know some tabs have only got half a dozen people, but often there can be 100 or two uh, for a team of six or ten um, so we're, if we can help each other with that information and designing things and being aware of some of the pitfalls as it were that'll be a good thing i think that's a very good point that, that, that's about more logistics but also so i think covers everything with this sort of field is that it's a good place to have uh sops for, for almost everything yeah, agreed just a quick note, Sam. I've uh, I've got to move. <laughs> got to go off for offline for a little bit because I've got to move the community minibus and do a couple of other quick things. So sorry, I won't be able to have an input for a little while. <laughs> no worries. Is, are you are you heading off now? Have you got or is that in a minute? Um, yeah, I'm, I can listen for another five if, if okay. there's going to be a summary. Well, I was going to say if, you, if you've got anything you'd like to add quickly before you before you head off in this bit, um, at this point. Technical. Um, or just anything to do with sort of facilities and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, power systems. I agree with a lot of stuff that Karen said and others. Um, yeah, they're, they're good good titles and good areas that need discussion. Um, I could, literally, I don't want to bore anyone, but I could spend hours looking at all those areas and having input, but I think I've done enough. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, but if, you, if you've got if you've got any key points you'd like to make that you think would be especially relevant or that we, yeah. things that we might not realise, then this is, the, this is very much what it's for. Yeah. Okay. Um, on site storage. <laughs> uh, again, you never seem to have uh, an, enough space. Equally, we need to design things to be as small as possible without going silly. Um, but again, if, with a view to going to the moon or Mars, particularly Mars, um, size, weight, volume of anything that we take um, to a site, it's not, it's bad enough on Earth. But you can imagine for Moon and, moon and specifically Mars, um, all those those aspects, you know, size, weight, volume, mass, volatility, uh, length of storage, uh, they're all things that uh, 
good to try and help each other guiding what works and what doesn't or just to keep in mind when you're designing these things or looking to support something mm. very well said i think also regarding the sort of logistics um, in the analog missions we have to define on whether it's possible to uh, restock the supplies during the mission and do they take everything they need uh, with them immediately before the mission starts or is it possible to actually um, resupply and if so how is the resupply done okay that's a very good point yeah, they run out of yeah. food or they, they forgot a tool or something like that uh, it does happen um, what can be done then is it possible to resupply without compromising the mission Okay. I know, I know that Mars 500 didn't have any resu didn't have any resupply at all. Um, they had a sort of halfway. So they they when they did it, they sort of had their transit out period, and then they met at they again all air quotes met up with the the sort of Mars lander vehicle, which was already in orbit around Mars, and that had supplies inside it. So they had a sort of resupply halfway through the mission, but it was still things that had been in storage for a year, um, which I think is a very a very good approach, which may works well for long missions but um may need to be considered how to do it for the shorter ones um that's a very good point um we talked a bit it was mentioned a bit about experimental facilities about about having um specific experiments versus having generic things and be, being able to have a more of a, a workshop and a, and a lab um does anyone have thoughts about how that could sort of be useful. I mean, Stefan, if you've got if you've got any thoughts on that, just to try and include include everyone in the group, or well, Lorenzo for that matter, actually. Um, if you've got any thoughts coming actually Lorenzo, that's actually a good point because you've got more of a sort of uh, OSAM background. Um, would you see it to be a useful thing to have a sort of generic repairs workshop in a habitat and be able to have um, the ability for the crews to do repairs themselves or do you think that's the sort of extra complexity that wouldn't be terribly useful almost or if anyone else has an opinion on that on that sort of thing so i've seen it being included more and more in in concepts um mdrs has their workshop module now is is quite new No, hello. What's that? I mean, Karen, I feel I feel bad for picking on you because because you seem to have <laughs> the most views on these things. Um, well, sorry, I just had to step out for a second. Oh, it's fine. Could no worries. No worries. Question, please. <laughs> I'm just discussing about the 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 sort of having um, generic facilities, whether that's laboratories or workshops, being able to do sort of either repairing equipment in the field um, with the astronauts themselves rather than having support teams do it um, or having generic laboratories to allow experiments opportunities to be done based on research. Um, I know the second point is sort of very different to Amity's approach with the whole like, exploration cascade, but it'd be interesting to for yourself or for, or for anyone else who's got an opinion on, on having generic facilities to allow, to allow crew to do things or to allow a sort of a, a generalized workshop so, or a generalized laboratory so people can run experiments mission to mission to mission um, using the same equipment. I think it really depends on the nature of your experiments. It can obviously be an advantage if you have a more stable situation where you can continuously run a workshop. Um, or you want to do some limited experiments for two or three weeks. It depends when you when do you expect the results of the experiment. Mm -hmm. Is it a quick one? Yeah. Is what what data is is enough data? Uh, can you can you stop after three experiments runs that will take a total of two weeks, or do you need to to research something for three years? Yeah. So, but in, the, in terms of um, in terms of uh, having, that. 
in terms of having a laboratory um, that could be used on different missions for different purposes, but making sure you have a sort of multi-purpose lab. So thinking about like more like a university department where you'd have yeah. a, you wouldn't rebuild the lab each time you need to do a new experiment. You'd, you'd design the experiments around what equipment's already there. Is that a useful model to think about for habitats or is that, is that sort of backwards to the way we should be doing it and we should focus on, focus on the experiment and work backwards to the equipment that way? Well, if you have a fixed habitat, it, it can certainly be of an advantage because it's it's um, it brings cost down. You know? If you have yeah. multi-purpose, you don't have to recreate everything. And also it um, requires less training because people have been using it before. They might use it three missions later, the same people. You know, if, if we have the, the crews um, doing more than one mission, um, mm -hmm. It can make things easier. It might it will certainly make things cheaper. That's true. Would you see it as a down? Would, would I mean, having been having sort of run experiments or, or coordinated experiments, was there ever a sort of a pressure for that from your from PIs, or was that not really the case? No, because the experiments were too different. They couldn't share in Amadi. Okay. They they couldn't really share any equipment. Okay. That's interesting. There was not so many. There wasn't. There weren't so many laboratory experiments. That's true. I suppose for Amity, it's it's sort of off the end of the scale. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Margo, I've forgotten your name. I've forgotten her name. I'm very sorry. Um, Margo Jata. Margo Jata. I'm, very, I'm sorry. It's it's. I'm very tired. Um, coming, from, coming from a biology or sort of a biologist point of view, is that. And especially with Lunaris, which is more based on indoor experiments rather than surface stuff. Would you have a different opinion on, on having a laboratory or would you agree that it needs to be done experiment to experiment? Mm, you mean the equipment of the laboratory, biological laboratory? Yeah, so, so would you... I mean, I do well, yeah, that, my, yeah. my, actually, my dream would be to have something that's permanent. That would okay. be... Uh, amazing but of course there are some uh, yeah some experiments that would require more or less specialized equipment and this is often something that you can move in during okay. one particular mission then move out some of these machines are really small there is still a set of basic equipment that i would like to see in in a base mm, but yeah this is more complicated in a way that uh, we mentioned before that you you set up differently for longer experiments, differently for shorter. Mm -hmm. This is such a wide area that you 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 really have to put in the stuff that you are going to need. And uh, based on that, I think there there most most of the equipment could come in for a specific uh, mission for specific aims. So the things that uh, I, I think would be, would need to be permanent, <coughs> I'm, or maybe that's another thing to, to mention, uh, the, the garbage, right? So yeah. how yeah. you dispose of the garbage that is the biological experiment uh, garbage. When you work in the real life lab, you have different categories of trash and some of those need to be kept in special uh, conditions. So while planning to do some experiments that are to be undertook in the laboratory, you also need to consider maybe special uh, containers for this kind of trash that could be potentially um, you know, infectious, dangerous, or whatever. I, I know that it's not uh, the type of experiments you plan, but still, after you do some of the experiments, you categorize this uh, trash as biological, and then you have to deal with it in a certain way. So <laughs> maybe that's super uh, down to, to earth, no, it's, but it's, you it's need to, yeah, you, you need to uh, maybe uh, plan for, you know, containers or, mm -hmm this kind of uh, disposal yeah. uh, well, it's, it's, it's relevant for, for chemicals as well right because if you're doing like geochemistry and, and trying to process rock samples you've got the same problem just with with 
different waste classes. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a general problem for, for I think many sort of laboratories type experiments where you're not just taking a piece of uh, like just doing like microscopy. If you're doing yeah, processing, you need to handle waste. Exactly, exactly. And if you want to do some experiments that require either, you know, clean room or uh, laminar flow, maybe chamber or something like this, I don't think the, the laminar is something that we could replicate, but maybe a kind of box-like chamber that you could work in that's isolated from outside. This is not that difficult to have and it i think it would be cool you know uh, envision this kind of box where you put your hands in on the in gloves right so you yeah, yeah really... the glove box yeah the glove box so this is something that i think it, it would be cool it would maybe allow for doing more that's a very good point i've included in, in my own habitat designs i've often included that as a sort of nice to have but I've, I've, it's nice to hear that it's actually really useful You mentioned actually that there's some equipment that um would be good to have permanently. Is there anything you'd see as a as a biologist that would be the most important stuff to to include? Um, in well, you know, biological stuff like the basic uh, basic things like the <laughs> the scales, uh, the binocular, maybe mm. Mm, you know, set of uh, glassware or this. This really depends on how much funds you have and what you can do. If you have funds, you can have PCR machine, right? If you don't, you cannot. Then you also yeah. can have some iPads. You can have you know, all the plastic that's needed for, for that. Uh, a nice thing that we had in Lunaris was this uh, simulator of. Uh, uh, I forgot the name in English. So sorry. This is the uh, thing that generates lowered gravity by. Oh, the position, position brown. machine. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I actually thought that this this was quite quite cool. But definitely, uh, when I think about the biology lab, I think about a space that could be um, sealed from outside exper from outside uh, environment. So if it could be this box with gloves, that's fine. So that would be uh, something I would like to see. Yeah, pipettes for measuring stuff. Um, scales if we need to to use that and uh, i in a biology lab i have also autoclaves so maybe this is something that could be yeah that's a good point for, clean, for cleaning as well as a yeah because that keeps keeps up uh, keeps adding yeah. up the so maybe that that's really interesting that's a very very interesting position that I'd love to discuss more about that at some point. So then that might be a whole separate discussion in the future one is how you do waste waste handling from experiments. Exactly. Because... This is this is not something that uh, <laughs> uh, is, is addressed enough in, yeah. in my opinion. And it's, it's not a very it's, sexy topic, but it's very, very important. It's not. It's not. But, you know, you also don't plan just to go somewhere for two weeks and collect all your garbage and then take it out. Mm. It can work if you have only two week mission, but it's not what we are simulating in the long run. So it would be cool if we could do yeah. something with this trash. Yeah, that's really great. OK, so I feel like that, has anyone got any further thoughts about this sort of field? Or, and if not, we can try and do some sort of concluding activities um, before we report back to, to the in-person group. Um, Lorenzo, I'm aware you haven't said a whole lot. If there's anything you'd like to add um, from what we've said, then, then now's the time for this field or for anything else. I just want to make sure everyone's included. Also fine if you want to just listen. That's allowed. Sorry, I missed uh, some words. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to add at this point before we sort of do some concluding concluding wrap up? Um, I think I think as uh, everything clear, I mean everything said. Okay, that's great. So looking at this cloud of post-it notes um, from mission design, I just want to make sure we have some sort of some conclusions almost that everyone agrees with that we think we can report back to the rest of the group on. Um, 
I would say, looking at this, that the conclusions from this are that finance is a really, really important part of the whole thing and should be should be baked in from day one. And also that it's it's really completely different for each mission. You can't have a single mission design that works best for everybody. Does anyone have any agreements or disagreements about those two points as a, conclu- as a key conclusion they'd like to make or, or elaborations on that? Agree. I'll assume that's agreement if it's if there's no 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 discuss, no further discussion. Um, uh, okay, moving around to human factors. I'm trying to see what because we had a lot of discussion there about different things. Um, I'm trying to think what the key takeaways that we can we can tell people are. Um, lots about different stuff about um, allowing people to be more creatively expressive, like uh, self expressive. Um, and artistic. Um, if anyone's, I just think it's a very interesting takeaway to have and a very good point. Um, some discussions about differently able astronauts as well, and about allowing, um, allow, using that as as both as a as a very important thing, but as a as a way to think more about ergonomics and about about user experience. Um, and privacy important, but in perhaps differently to how you assume it would be. Um, if anyone's got anything to add to those because key conclusions, then then please do say. Um, I feel like I'm doing the, the conclusion here, but please do add anything at this point. I, I don't want to be to dictate the outcomes, but I'm just trying to read as best as I can what the notes we've taken are. Um, no, okay. Well, I take that as a as a sign. That it's a good thing to talk about then. Um, architecture. We had the sleep. The discussion about about sleep and about sleeping space is a very a very nice um, takeaway, and also about um, controlling sort of ambience of different stimuli. I think are two very very nice conclusions to draw from that about about how to use how to use the architectures and to use the space better, um, which is good conclusions to take away. I'll just put that in bold so we have that for the for the reference, um, and then for technical things. Um, learning from different it feels like that that's the one where correct me if i'm wrong especially if you if you disagree with it that there's a lot to be learned from other industries both sort of the way industry handles logistics and energy but also the way that research labs professionally handle things like waste disposal equipment storage training um and the balance between that versus customized experiments is that a reasonable thing to to take as a conclusion or is am i, am I ignoring things that are really useful to consider. Okay. I'll take that as a as that I've got the answer right in that case. Um, I will just ping over to say that we're ready to share these conclusions with the rest of the group. Um, has anyone got any any anything else they'd like to add after the discussion? I feel like we've we've focused on these these four areas. If there's anything else from different parts of habitat design that would be good to discuss. Um, just while we wait for the the onsite group to finish up their finish up their 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 part. Um, just to sort of go around, um, Stefan, if you and anything else you'd like to add about the the whole the whole thing of, of design, um, 
or do you feel we haven't covered it all very well? For the moment, no. Uh, I've... Okay. Are there any points you'd like to try and try and elaborate on that you think were wouldn't were sort of covered, but only briefly, or do you think this is a, a good a good uh, maybe, overall? Maybe they want to pick for the architecture because there was uh, for the it was only on wood uh, floor or not. Uh, because if you had a floor, uh, it's, uh, you have also some logistic uh, difficulty. You could have some logistic uh, issue if you want to have on, with the uh, with the uh, with the floor or, or not. With the level floor. Okay. Because if you have only one floor, it's, it's, it's simple to just to build it. But if we have pretty level, um, we may, maybe we have so, a lot of uh, we are more logistics and to issue to just to uh, build it on site. That's a very good um, point. Maybe there was so maybe a uh, risk issue because if you have some people going upstairs and downstairs, you could have some risk issue that they that they can fall. So yes. That's a very good point. Thank you for that. That's another thing to add on. Um, just working around. Oh, Eleanor is here. So we've got the in insight group. Anyone else got any conclusions quickly? Um, Lorenzo, do you want to add anything? Anything you want to add at this point before we before we share our conclusions? Oh, hi, Simon. <laughs> Simon is saying hi. <laughs> okay, are we just doing final conclusions here? Just what you guys get ready. Um, I think we're. Has anyone else got anything to add? Reese, just check quickly. Do you want to add anything before we before we finish? No, I think that's. Uh, I think you've covered a lot there. I think it's an interesting point that uh, Stefan just made about we haven't really spoken about risks, and he's the first person to talk about risks. That's and very I, I true. think that's really interesting. That's very true. It, we did touch the point on the things like sharp edges, but we didn't really consider that within a that broad risk framework. That's a very good point. I'll make a note of that. That's, that's something definitely something to follow up with later, I think, or is it to discuss at a future future thing? Because it's because uh, that's obviously like a place you could really go quite badly wrong. And there was the yeah. the, the incident at um Pisces a few years ago with the the electrocution, which was a really scary outcome from that. Um, so that could be a very good point to have a, at a future workshop. But it's it, it's having not just as you go along, just having that framework in place. So you're always referencing what are the risks is always that question. And you even look to have a framework whereby you think of maybe lines of defense to, to cover all of those risks. So in the construction process, you, you are looking to address key concerns. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think, and, and reading reading about reports on the high, from the high seas incident, that was very, I think that's a takeaway that they sort of missed almost. So it's good to have that um, come up here as well. That's a good, good point to end on because it's a very important thing. Um, Eleanor, I think we're ready for you, I believe. We're ready for you. Oh, uh, awesome. Whatever you want to present. Do they see us? Do they hear us? They see us and they yeah, hear us. Yeah, Sam. Uh, okay. uh, about Hi, Simon. The risk. Uh, Sam, uh, it's about the risk. Uh, um, you cannot just uh, consider about the construction. Operation and maintenance is much higher, much bigger mm -hmm. risks. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, no. The, 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 this the, this small small thing should be like uh, ten times bigger <laughs> and cover all, the, all, 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 all your all your schedule. I think we're saying that's a good point for future workshop almost. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. Next beam. Fantastic. So Next, Sam, yeah. uh, we'll mute ourselves, and if you can walk us through what you did. Um, <clears throat> for those who are online, haven't met us. Uh, big hello from the on-site team. We're very much looking forward to your presentation and hopefully we can also, uh, we have lots of architects, space architects also yes. with us today. Hopefully they will blow your mind. So I'm not sure, we'll see, it depends, you know, how hungover they are. But anyway, fire ahead, Sam. Okay, let me just get this all set up so I can see you guys a decent size. There we go. Okay, so I think we were, we were working off the same same slides and we ended up doing lots and lots of post-it notes about different things, um, focusing on the four areas of stuff. Um, so mission design, we had a, lots of talk about it, about how um, how mission design sort of impacts 
um, the habitat and vice versa. Um, some very nice lessons from Amadi um, about how that affected and from some people who've done Dodaris missions as well. Um, uh, the two big sort of takeaways, just to start with those, is that finance is really, really important when it comes to mission design um, and limits a lot of what people can and can't do. Um, and it's something that we didn't really mention too much in the session because it's such a sort of underlying topic it might be good to discuss in the future um and also that there's no sort of every design is very different there's no real standard that you can pull from um so some people care more about moving around um amadi talked about the benefits of moving from site to site partly because it means you can do more science but also means you can sort of collaborate with more people and get more partners um uh things like that. Um, crew size, we had a discussion about making the crew bigger and how that affects everything a lot. Um, not least because it means you have to have a bigger support crew um, and you can't just necessarily have an arbitrarily large, arbitrarily long mission because you need to have a thousand people in the mission control, um, which is a real limit. But again, the two takeaways with the, the, the finance and, and cost is very important and that you can't really have a standard design. Um, there's a lot more points that we can go into if you've got questions for what we talked about um but that was the takeaways there going to human factors um we had three sort of themes of discussion that we went along sort of three threads um the first one being is that it's we felt, thought it'd be really important to allow astronauts to have some sort of time and space for self-expression and for creating art or for being artistic and and not just working the whole time but actually um relaxing and letting themselves um be creative um, which is something that's been more and more the case on, on real space flights um, with more and more sort of musicians going up and, and poets and, and artists um, or astronauts who, who do all this stuff. And it'd be really interesting to have, more important to have a space for analog astronauts to do this as well. Um, uh, similarly, sort of having, there was a mention about having natural materials to sort of allow this to be a bit less of a clinical environment and a bit less of a sort of 24 seven work, but have, have people be allowed to to unwind in that way. Um, then as well as that, we had a discussion about privacy um, and about how that's important for astronauts and about how it's important for some things, but not necessarily for everything. So one of the conclusions was that sleeping space doesn't have to be that private because you should be asleep in it. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a, a sort of individual sleeping room, but having a private bathroom is a very important. Um, and having a space where you can we said to, to retreat to um, would be very good. So you can, whether that's just a space where you can be on your laptop or on your phone and people don't disturb you, um, or could it be as far as having VR goggles or a sort of a single person sort of working area that where you can't be interrupted. Um, and then finally, we had a talk about um, uh, disabled or differently abled astronauts as a, a really important thing to include on missions, um, partly because uh, there's a genuine discussion about if, people with physical or physical disabilities or people who aren't um, neurotypical may be in some ways better suited for actual space flights than people who are neurotypical or, or so on. Um, there's a lot of more to be done there, but also because looking at um, design through the lens of how people with different abilities could interact with it is a really good way to um, look at ergonomics and look at um, sort of ultimate usability and ultimate um, how good this systems are to use. Um, especially because a lot of a lot of engineers will will sit from the comfort of their own design office and not think about how people will interact with things in an EVA suit or when they're in a rush when they're very much under stress. So using that as a as a lens to to force designers to be more ergonomically minded could be very useful. Um, and there's some more points about sort of human factors and so on um, that we went into. Then going across to the architecture um, at sort of a high level. We had a couple of quite interesting takeaways. Um, we mentioned at the end, safety is something that we sort of didn't discuss too much, but it would be very interesting to talk about in future because it really impacts everything else, um, not just during the construction and sort of how the how it's designed, but the operations of it are very important. Um, one quite fun discussion, which sort of reflects the sleeping quarters privacy thing, would be looking at um, how much people care about sleeping space. And... I can't remember who mentioned it. it, may have been Alan, it'd be really interesting to have a poll of analog astronauts and look at their trends in how they prefer to sleep um, in terms of if they prefer to have um, a very quiet or very like secluded sleeping space or if they don't mind it being relatively noisy or, or cramped or anything like that. Um, and if that could even be a useful selection criteria 
for astronauts if they don't mind sleeping in a really like like in the military if you have quite a noisy sleeping environment um and then the other interesting discussion that we had was about um sort of changing the space between living and working and about how sort of traditionally on earth you do that by just having two spaces you'd have a, a, a sort of social space and a working area but you could do that if you have limited space by changing other stimuli rather than by changing the actual location so changing the lighting environment changing the soundscape changing the smellscape having different scents being produced by sort of um by uh, sort of scented candles or anything like that to, to use that as a cue to allow people to change their mode of working or how they use the space without having to move from a laboratory space to a to a live to a dining area just put a tablecloth over the table and it changes the space a lot so there's an interesting discussion about how you can um, make the space multi-purpose in a much a sort of more mass efficient and space efficient and cost effective way than actually having multiple spaces. Um, so those are the two sort of interesting conclusions we came to there. And then we had a bit of a talk about technical stuff, about facilities you could have in an analog base um, in terms of things like power systems, logistics, facilities, and so on. Um, the takeaways we had is that there's a lot to learn from industry in this way, because a lot of the problems we have to tackle are the same as what's dealt with in the military or in other remote bases or in research facilities, universities. Um, it's going to be really good to look at some things, um, things like logistics, uh, power system handling is a really sort of topical problem in industry as well as in analog habitats. And there should be more dialogue in it where analogs learn from them rather than the other way around. Um, even things like um, waste disposal and waste handling for chemistry and biology experiments is something that's not or, or that we felt hadn't been really addressed that well in, in habitats and there's a lot to learn from universities there um, and also that a lot of the, the stuff here has got a real balance between um, or sort of trade-off more than a balance between a habitat that's um, sort of fixed in, a fixed place permanent habitat that has more generic equipment um, versus having stuff that's more experiment focused, um, as in the case with Amity is sort of the very far off the spectrum in that direction, um, where it's very much focused on the exact experiments being run. There's really no shared, shared equipment. Um, you design everything around those experiments versus somewhere more like Lunaris or perhaps MDRS, where they have a more fixed facility and you're working to define your operations around that. Um, and there's no clear as answer as to which one's best of those two. Um, those are the sort of the two sort of ends the spectrum that you need to sort of trade off between and balance. Um, those are our sort of takeaways. We had a lot more discussions about specific things, um, drilling into details about things that would be good to look at in future. And we, we thought as well as that, just to sort of conclude, the two things that we think would be very interesting to discuss in future would be um, safety in analogs. That's a very cross-cutting field that goes from all the way through to design and operations to sort of the way you handle it, but also looking at um, looking at costs, which would be a pretty potentially contentious issue because it's a very, I think people are quite sensitive about it, but it's a very, we, we all agreed that it sort of underlies everything here and, and there's nothing that isn't touched by trying to minimize cost or, or make the most effective use of the, of the budget. So those two points would be very interesting to discuss um, potentially in a future workshop. And that's our conclusions, really. We can go into any more, any, um, any other details. That's what we came up with. So. We'd love to hear what you did as well. Uh, thanks a lot, Sam. That was really, really cool. Uh, I think, Jack, you're going to give some of your thoughts uh, on the matter. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It, it was a very nice discussion you guys had. I will take the thing and I will address the whole. Uh, yeah. Uh, should I, should I, should I, do you want me to share my screen? Do you want me to share my screen or should I, to, or should I stop doing that? It's fine. It's fine. It's, it's in fact good for me okay. to. to uh, address something. So uh, this uh, mirror board that you created is really allowed people to discuss very like those different aspects of unlock design habitat, uh, uh, unlock habitat design. And if you would answer, like if one would answer every single uh, topic here, you would get something like a ultimate unlock habitat. But the question is whether it's even feasible to have one ultimate analog habitat if the mission design can be so different when you look at crew, uh, uh, crew uh, count, like crew size. Now we are focusing on missions that are like six people, four people, and it's still, um, and it already impacts your 
whole mission uh, in, in science when it comes to analog studies, but you can easily imagine that there will be a need for uh, bigger uh, analogs that will uh, host 12, 20, 50 people maybe even, and you need to uh, think about what that kind of analogs will look like. Maybe we need to uh, look at existing ex uh, communities in extreme environments. So obviously, uh, uh, Arctic uh, and polar bases uh, as an analog to learn from. Uh, but if you even think about this thing, if you are focusing on human factors, your architecture will be very different than, let's say, when you're focusing on technical parts. When we look at technical, um, like prototype habitats, like Hera or she habitat, those are habitats designed around uh, system engineering to put those systems in place and then be able to put this potential habitat on the rocket. And it's a very different thing than uh, like MDRS uh, or ICs, where you are creating a certain space to simulate and allow people to interact with each other. So you're get, you're focusing on human factors rather than, than those than, than the system engineering. So it's very hard to decide what an ideal analog habitat should be. And here, it was a great opportunity to identify certain gaps in current stages of uh, or current designs of analogs. So I hope the groups that will be presented and uh, presenting uh, identified some of them because there are a lot of scenarios and structures that can allow us to uh, gather very different kinds of data. Uh, so there are no mobile habitats yet, or but maybe there are some, but this is uh, really uh, part of future space missions that are not investigated well enough yet. Mm, so if you think about it, uh, I would say that uh, the way the analog habitat is designed really, really, really uh, reflects what kind of data and research you would like to uh, get from it. And that probably having as many uh, habitats as possible uh, will be reflected in those, those uh, research gaps that people are ident identifying. And I think the next group will tell us more about that. Who would like to speak? So, um, yeah, Victoria? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. Let's just come in. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, We're supporters. We are. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, I don't know if you want to come here. Yeah, my handwriting is terrible. I so good luck can't with that. read that, <laughs> but it's okay. I'll add. Um, nice. So, I think the first thing that was addressed is the fact that uh, when you design a spacecraft, you think about limited space, but actually in habitats, what you want is sometimes a bit more space for comfort. So, you have to think how much do you want people to be comfortable or how much do you want to actually simulate really being a spacecraft? So, right. limited space also means less complexity, right? Uh, mm. So, it, it usually helps to get a better simulation. The only problem is obviously ventilation. So the more confined the space is, the more you have to have an adequate uh, ventilation system in it. Mm -hmm. um, the architecture also depends on the kind of activities that we have. Uh, yeah. It was also discussed that having sometimes one part of the habitat that could be changed depending on the mission. So for example, right. you, you mentioned, for example, of the- Yeah, device. so basically like, you know, depending on the mission objectives, we might want to create sort of a more modular environment where the actual purpose of the room can be changed depending on the purpose of the mission. So for instance, the last mission of Lunaris focused on a 24 hour EVA emergency situation, whereas we were more focused on Project Gravels and 3D printing mm -hmm. things. So we all had different priorities and in order to accomplish those priorities, we needed more access to different spaces. Um, so having kind of that flexibility built into the habitat would be really important to allow future crews and, you know, ongoing projects to flourish, but also give the opportunity to people to kind of explore their options during a mission. Um, then there was the other thing about yeah. 
how obviously the architecture englobes obviously both the technical side of mission design yeah. and just in general also the feel. So for example, a habitat that is smaller takes less, you know, heat and stuff. Right. Like so there's a practicality to it. However, if you were to think, uh, so you were mentioning about the human center design. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So for example, if you want to have a horizon view, so if you want to be able to see far away, you need a habitat that's a bit longer. So if you mm -hmm. were to have several modules, you would not put them in a compact group. You would try to put them maybe in the line so you could have this this feel of horizon the comfort of the using it yeah. exactly yeah and the problem with this is obviously that you know it changes a bit design would it be more akin to spacecraft would your mm -hmm. spacecraft right. be one long thing usually we try to put the modules next mm -hmm. to one another so do you want right. to be more akin to what it is how is it going to be on the moon so this is one of the impacts that we found mm -hmm. we discussed a really interesting subject that jack mentioned uh, before uh, was about a uh, tourist on, oh yeah uh space station so how do yeah. you accommodate them and how would that actually impact the design obviously yeah. our expectation as analog astronauts is that you will pee in a bucket and you don't necessarily need the most beautiful place obviously it's really cool when you have the but it's not something that you expect you usually expect yeah. the bunker you expect cables you expect yeah. machine you expect to have your treadmill next to your toilet next to your bed next to the plants that you're growing uh, it removes a bit of the glamour, and we're seeing more and more mm -hmm. other bases that look nice. And yeah. I guess the more you're going to have tourists, the more you're going to have this. And then it's Take just about yeah. this. Uh, point exactly. of, yeah. It's design. it's a lot mm -hmm. having to do with tolerance, right? Like we kind of discussed this mm -hmm. concept of making sure that everybody's expectations and mm -hmm. goals are met, but also ensuring that they don't infringe on other people's goals mm -hmm. and expectations. Mm -hmm. So providing a space that, that it is capable for you know people to integrate what they want out of the mission, but then not have them you know kind of ruin someone else's experience as a result is really important. And that obviously kind of ties into the mm -hmm. first topic, which is comfort, right? Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily need it to be entirely practical. Um, yeah. Some people require more comfort than others. And that is a very important psychological point um, that we even experienced on our mission, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's good to take that into account when you're considering crews that are made up of different, you know, goals, expectations, mm -hmm. or even careers, right? Mm -hmm. You've got artists, architects, maybe even scientists, engineers working together in the same space. Mm -hmm. How do you make a space that is livable for all of those people? Mm -hmm and you know accessible and yeah we discussed how it's uh, hard to find a balance between like technical demands and the, yeah. you know this human factor because like, as you said yeah uh, we have different needs and so on so yeah. um we need also some private space and yeah. enough and not uh, it's not the same like uh, design the practical uh with the fact, practical guidelines, and mm -hmm. we have to think that we design for the human being. Right. So it's have something different. We need some um, space to, you know, uh, custom a bit. So it's yeah. kind of your, it's very right. important to have a human factor. Yes. Like my example that I gave was the atrium that we have at Lunaris. We have bean bags in the middle, and everybody uses those bean bags to have meetings, but it also provides this sense of like togetherness and comfort. Mm -hmm. When we're there, it doesn't feel like so rigid and, you know, scientific, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's kind of more of a community. Mm -hmm. And we also have artifacts and Easter eggs within the habitat from previous missions, which add this feel of like continuity, right? Mm -hmm. So not just like, you know, scientific and research-based continuity, but also like emotional continuity yeah, for the course. crews. Which is represented if you're still talking about furniture, because right. you would mention a table for yep. a meal. So this actually impacts even the flight plan and thinking, get astronauts to have a meal together, yep. have a sense of community. And this, I think regardless if you're a tourist, you're not like astronauts, yeah. a future astronaut, having this meal together yeah. is a way to to bring things and the sense of community is quite important mm -hmm. right another thing that we did discuss was also the kind of materials that we would use yeah. obviously if you want to simulate a spacecraft usually you will have cables and right. you know yeah. containers as we mentioned mm -hmm. however one thing that we do not have in another mission and i think it's missing for us we don't have this wonderful view of planet earth that you would get on the iss and the uh, cupola um, and uh, where we would, when we would be on the moon and Mars, and we'd be there for longer periods of time for help, we'd probably be working with, for example, with wood, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Yeah. Um, so it was also mentioned about smell and things yeah, like that. Yeah, smell and the different like, senses, yeah. 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 Um, so also, what kind of materials would you use in the base? And usually we would quite refer to some Earth-like connection, Earth-inspired design mm -hmm. uh, that would just really just help in bringing a bit of connection back to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was part of it. Uh, Russian design, yeah. So, so for example, we mentioned about the EVA. Yeah. And also, well, one thing I found interesting, so obviously, I guess if you're an architect, you 
think about okay what is the purpose of this thing mm. but it's probably I, I i guess one of the only cases where you guys have to deal with psychologists mm. really is yeah. a very important thing it's yeah. like it's not you know you don't just build a building because you need 20 officers and it needs to be bright and it's going to be a smart house or not in this case you need to know is the crew going to be okay and they're going right. to be able to do the activities and feel right and i guess that brings a whole new factor and i don't know if you yeah. have some comments about safety that. i mean yeah like that's <laughs> that's kind of assumed to be a baseline in a lot of analog sites right like you need to ensure the safety and well-being of the crew at all costs right and that kind of exceeds everything else right research is kind of below that um and so ensuring that the space is you know private and comfortable but also limits the amount of accidents that can occur is really important and you know having you know rules in place to avoid those things is also great but making sure that the space is accommodating for a safe environment is also key i guess in that situation i, I think um, we can we have a technology when you have a technology yeah. we have a man we can engineer everything actually <laughs> but what can go wrong is the human yeah. mental health and so and so the only way to know, know, right? The only way to know sometimes, we can't whether test that, it. yeah, it's not easy to test that thing. Like sometimes, even if the space has been designed in the most perfect way, sometimes accidents can still happen, right? And so kind of learning from experience, seeing what works and what doesn't work, that's obviously something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, do you see any need, uh, obviously, when the uh, fit condition of that, like 14 days? Sure. And then do you have, if you have a lot of people, uh, there are not, uh, not know each other. Right. So, uh, for 14 days, mm -hmm. you can have fun. You can have mm -hmm. something uh, but typical mission, yeah. Apartment mission, but not typical itself. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. Because it's about two years. Yeah. So they can get to know each other. Well, yeah. you, uh, the, the, my question is, do you see uh, any means, especially in design, that can uh, fast and speed up this connection process. I mean, gr group dynamic. Yeah, um, no, 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 relation, no, no, yeah. Just to speed, uh, to speed up this uh, being together. Right. It's just like a, 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 a shrink engineering. <laughs> What I would say, at least from the point of view of our mission, right, because this is very recent in my mind, I can speak to this pretty clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. So like, you know, we all came into this mission not knowing each other previously, right? And so I can at least speak to the way that the architecture of the habitat informed crew dynamics in that sense. So, you know, when we entered, there was this communal space, the atrium, right? Everybody is able to hang out there and discuss and have meetings and whatever. Mm -hmm. But we found that in the first few days, letting people have their privacy was yeah. so yeah. important. Yeah. Like it's good to have these commun communal spaces because some people are extroverted and need that interaction. But even the most extroverted people need privacy, especially when they're so overwhelmed by meeting new people. And this goes back to that human factors challenge, which is ensuring that the space has enough like nooks we kind of mentioned, right? Having like these little spaces that don't necessarily connect directly to the main room that you can sort of not hide in, but just take a minute to breathe in. Like, the, you know. The, 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 the because, uh, because of that, you spent a lot of time. In, in, yeah, the, 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 I mean, okay, so I will say that I was also very busy next to the 3D printers. I was ensuring the prints were working. But yeah, I personally found it really relaxing to just be able to kind of spend that time in that space. And, you know, that was my escape, if you will. Uh, you know, commander, I have to be speaking to people constantly and making sure that everybody's doing great. But then I also need time to check in on my Myself. And sometimes that can take place in a room as simple as a 3D print lab, but that, you know, having those environments where that is possible is super key to encouraging good group dynamics. Okay, but if I can add a word, usually, and this is our uh, policy, it's not necessarily um, uh, done uh, every time, but it is good to have the pre flight training. Uh, like uh, Series A, Series B training, and underwater training, or uh, for 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 tactics. That's what we did for the first four crews mm -hmm. in Lunaris. But we can offer that, and we offer that as Lunaris. But there is no interest in groups which are coming to pay for them. So uh, you cannot do it without money. We we have the whole know how right. everybody diverse uh, commando groups, whatever you like, and we know how to do yeah. it. But from the crew dynamics point of view, this is something that should 
precede any mission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily from one mission to another, but to collect four or five crews right. and once a year perform such a thing. Mm -hmm. And then they have a uh, common um, experience, experience of yeah. simulated danger or real danger or right. whatever they, 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 they face during this uh, trip. Yeah. And this is something I strongly recommend to yeah. take into consideration for those people who are um planning the missions so the better planning the better exercise before the better output <laughs> yeah and she has a great training uh, as well as uh, uh as well and uh, but that's something that is done for those missions that are once here and they the budget is is part of the one mm -hmm. one one event Right. And time. Yes, and but time. Can, we can we can we uh, can but, but the problem was that during pandemics people were not so eager for they were not allowed. To right, so that's fair. Yeah. If somebody is from US and is supposed to take mission in the end of the uh, September and you ask this person to come in May to have such a training, yeah, they won't. <laughs> or it'll be more difficult, right? Yeah. That is like a barrier to yeah, participation. Yeah. Um, but I guess like you know, these things can obviously improve crew dynamics before even entering the habitat, right? Like that provides already a baseline of communication skills and interaction between the crew that can actually facilitate everything we're talking about. But then when they actually do enter the habitat, how do we allow that crew dynamic to continue, right? Because obviously being in these extreme environments uh, can be really beneficial for bringing people together. But then when the mundane sort of like routine tasks start to kick in and everybody just has to do normal things, but like in a very weird environment, it can be quite challenging to feel, you know, like you are still yourself or like it can be very disorienting sometimes and having time to check in on yourself is also really, really important. So. Okay, I have one. What, I should I to ask your questions really loudly so they can hear? Oh, right, Otherwise yeah. I have to write it. Let's say it very loudly. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, it's about what you said. It's uh, <clears throat> that online together task. Can also heal the situation. Of course, nothing will change the group training, but three uh, 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 missions that you need to work even, together. Even if somebody did this training <coughs> with the military, he, he or she did this training with other people. <laughs> and then you talk about crew dynamics, you need the crew in one place right. first, and then you apply the dynamics. Yeah. And then you cannot do it. Uh, oh, I think I think that's not completely true because doing Ascapus one, we got delayed by over a year, and do it that year, I didn't see my astronauts for at least nine months, and Zoom was actually sufficient for me to read my crew. So I knew how they reacted, I knew which how to give feedback to them, I knew what they liked or not, but I know that some people. Dislike Zoom. It's not everybody but that you, you, able you, to read. You, you get the uh, knowledge of your crew in the peaceful condition of their rooms and their armchairs. Exactly. And computers. Exactly. And it's totally different than if you went, which is helicopter underwater escape train. Of course, it's different from <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's the point, though. But you can. <laughs> but you get also both. See how how it, how, it's, how it's, 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 it's almost a matter of quantitative, quantitative and uh, qualitative. Uh, yeah. Research. Yeah. If we're doing mission after mission to get more data, yeah. you really need to. And you you need to have this you need both of those views. If you have people who only work in, for example, yeah. I know some people who work extremely well in extreme environment. Why? Because they spend their time climbing and being in mountains. But when we were doing the online class, they were extremely impatient, they were unfocused, yeah. and they were not doing quality work. And the thing is, when you are in a base, I expect you to do both works well. Extreme environment and procedures alike. If you're not capable to do both of them, if you do not abide to training, both doing online or not, yeah. then <laughs> it's... <laughs> and, 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 so, so the thing is, you have to have both. Obviously, the extreme environment is, is the best way to get your crew quickly by because you have to trust them. You have to trust them. They're going right. to be your roommates. They're going to be your best friends. They're going to be your commander. They're going to be your, your flight surgeon, whatever it is. So right. obviously, it's the kind of relationship that, yes, you need extreme environment for. But the online training does provide part of this. Yeah, right. It's amazing about it. It's not going to be as useful because you say because of physical training and because you're starting pointing out. 
I definitely compliments. I can see yeah. what it says. But the question is if you don't solve all the problems okay. before the mission at this case, and the mission is smooth, and you get no information about the human factor because you right. already solved all the problems online before mm -hmm. the mission. And you don't have this problem. But then we why want to check or something. No, it's so getting to me. Totally um, yeah. 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 Just looking yeah. for your design. Yeah. 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 Ye
at high seas from a human factor standpoint, there's two large windows. And luckily you're on Mauna Kea and you look out the window and you see Mauna, well, no, you're on Mauna Loa, you look out the window, you see Mauna Kea and uh, it's Mon Mauna Olympus, right? So even though you're looking outside and there's a window, it still has that vibe of being on Mars, which is really nice. Uh, there's a large eating area and high seas. Uh, cooking activities are together and those are like a social activity where uh, you're helping each other bake or modify ingredients based on what you have. Uh, there's no real shower allowed during my high seas mission. So that was more of a, a human factors challenge. There were two bathrooms though, so uh, people could use two different places to go to the bathroom. Um, there is no internet or social media that was allowed and that was strictly enforced. They took our SIM cards at high seas, which I thought was great just because it forced everyone to be much more present with each other and, and really feel that analog environment. Uh, at high seas, we had a pretty strict like Easter egg activity. So we, there were hints that were left from previous crews and then we had to find a location in the lava rocks on the other side of the hill somewhere where the actual uh, Easter egg uh, container was in like a lava tube. And then once we brought that into the habitat, it was like a social activity where we'd watch previous crews and what they did for their previous Easter eggs. And then we come together as a crew and plan an activity that would try to top what they did. So it was like a very kind of fun part of the, the analog mission. And there's also like a kind of a way to bond with previous crews that you never met before because you saw all these videos that they created over the course of years and you're like, wow, that's cool. Um, at high seas, we relied on uh, primarily freeze dried food. In the US, I guess it's just easier to uh, buy things like large cans of freeze dried chicken or beef uh, or vegetables. So because of that, when you're eating the foods, a lot of times they didn't really taste normal. They tasted like food, but just the consistency was sometimes a, a bit off. Um, human factors, we also had the, this lettuce grow uh, stand where we we're growing lettuce and it was recycling about 70 liters of water, but it had this like kind of peaceful like waterfall sound and it was kind of central to the atrium and it just kind of like brought this atmosphere that was really nice. Now going to Linares in terms of human factors that we talked about, uh, the sleeping capsules are open, so they're not very private, but they do provide some level of privacy. Um, and a lot of people kind of like you guys mentioned, like would close themselves off in certain modules, whether it's the, the engineering module with, with the 3D printers or in the bio lab. And people really enjoy kind of having their space to work on their experiments and kind of be away from the crew certain times of the day. Uh, the lighting schedule was actually, um, different because it is artificial, but it's also nice the way that you could build a schedule based on sleep preferences, uh, based on moods. Uh, the high ceiling in the atrium was uh, a very positive thing from a human factor standpoint. Uh, one bathroom in, in Lunares, unless you count the, uh, the shelter compost toilet. Uh, and and there, are, there are plants in the bio lab. So in Lunares, even though different missions had different amounts of plants, just uh, having uh, the hydroponics going, if they were going, that sound, the same kind of waterfall sound, just having green anything in there, it was definitely a, a calming uh, sensation. And uh, from a mission design standpoint, so starting with high seas again, again, you're on the side of Mauna Loa, you're on a volcano, there's lava rocks everywhere, so the EVAs are much more uh, intense. Uh, you have to like watch out like where you're walking. There's only certain types of lava rocks that you're allowed to walk on, for example. And uh, there's a lot more planning involved because you have to go on Google Maps. You plan out your entire course, whether it's a two or three hour EVA. You have certain checkpoints. You have blackout zones where you're not in communication with HAPCOM anymore for a couple hours at a time. And you're checking in like, okay, we're entering the blackout zone. This is all communicated. And then you're on your own for a couple hours. Um, we're relying on handheld kind of maps that we pre-program with different checkpoints. And sometimes you get a little lost, you get a little disoriented with your team and you're trying to figure out which way you're supposed to go to find the right lava tube entrance at the right area because there's many different lava tubes to, to dive into. Um, that made EVAs more difficult. You're also at elevation. So you're at roughly uh, 2,500 meters of elevation, which makes, makes things more difficult. Um, you're dealing with, everyone's wearing kind of like a motorcycle type helmet, 
that has ventilation, but based on how hard you're breathing, based on uh, how much you're moving, based on if you're in the lava tube, sometimes you fog up a lot and you need more ventilation. So just another aspect to think about, the power levels of your backpacks. Sometimes if someone didn't uh, manage their power, if their ventilation was on high, the entire EVA, sometimes they would die because they ran out of power. And that was kind of like not a good thing. We're trying to avoid that at all costs, of course. Uh, mission design at high seas, we were super strict about water intake uh, to the point where if we were turning the faucet on full blast, our commander would yell at us because it's like, what are you doing? Like just a little trickle. And it was like very, very strict. And everyone, because I was enforced so early on, people just got on board with it. Like, okay, like this is really serious. Like we only have, uh, you know, 300 liters of water for the whole two week mission. And every morning we're checking in, what are our water levels at? Do we need to adjust anything? Are we allowed to eat soup today or do we have enough water for that? You know, it was, it was all part of the dialogue. Um, another thing that was enforced very strictly was we had to finish our leftovers. So like there was no throwing away food. Like if we had dinner the night before and there was leftovers, we had to eat those at lunch before anything else could be cooked. And that was enforced. And I was just like, wow, like we can't just throw away random food that we don't feel like eating anymore. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there, there's <laughs> um, workouts in terms of um, <laughs> uh, workouts. We, we thought they could be more structured in terms of uh, how they were actually designed because workouts were allowed to be something like yoga or stretching. There was like a workout time, but there was no real guidance in terms of what could actually be useful for presenting muscular atrophy or, or bone density loss. Uh, in terms of trash at, at high seas, uh, they had to be taken out to a landfill drop-off point in our spacesuits. So that was kind of cool because you had to go through the pressure lock and uh, just felt a bit more real. Uh, and we relied entirely on compost toilets. So everything was a urinal or a compost toilet. There was no regular toilet to be used. In the NARAs, uh, the EVAs, they're still inside. So in that aspect, it can be, you can feel like you're still in simulation when you're doing EVAs because uh, yeah, even though you're on the side of a volcano at high seas, when you look up, there's still like clouds sometimes, sometimes it's raining, we call them dust storms, but there's still kind of, maybe you see like a small plant growing in the rocks. So sometimes it kind of pulls you back out of simulation. Whereas uh, at Lunaris, it's like, well, nothing really is there to pull you out of simulation. Um, there is uh, the cooking environment. So right now at Lunaris, they're cooking uh, frozen and shelf stable food, but it still reminds you sometimes of, as a food that you're kind of used to still. Uh, in the past, we used Lyle foods, which was all freeze dried food, which uh, brought the simulation experience uh, more intensely because you're like, wow, this is this is not a normal way to be eating something. Um, in terms of uh, mission design, we're always transforming the atrium based on the needs. So like at Lunaris, sometimes uh, we would transform the atrium into an eating area where we would all have like a kind of a formal dinner together in this in the center area. Of course, there's movie nights, there was uh, EVA planning and EVAs that were going on in the atrium. So based on the needs of the mission, you transform the atrium. Um, let's see some technical aspects. So going to uh, high seas. So you had a, a bio lab that was used for experiments that was kind of away from the main atrium. There's a separate engineering module that was uh, like a shipping container. Um, there are multiple levels, like I mentioned earlier. Upstairs is just for chilling, or for sleeping. Downstairs is like the work environment. Uh, we had real kind of battery and solar panel issues. So at high seas, relied, we relied entirely on solar energy. And that was a real thing. That was a decision that they made. And there's a huge solar panel next to the, the facility, but that's what we use exclusively. So when there are too many days of clouds in a row, that actually affected us where we would have to go into like a dark mode sometimes for multiple days at a time until the sun came back out. And uh, we just have to really watch closely our power intake levels. Um, so again, it made it much more real. Sometimes we'd be praying for sun because we're like, we just want some lights, please. Um, sometimes we have to go out and try to fix the solar panel if there's some kind of issue with some of the solar cells. Again, everyone had to go in their space suits, you go outside, and it just makes the environment more real. Uh, water resupply missions were much tougher being on the side of a volcano. Uh, we had two separate, roughly 1,000 liter water containers, reservoirs. 
And um, again, we're very, very strict with our usage because one resupply had to be enough to uh, supply roughly, um, what was it? 2000, roughly four to five missions. So one resupply would supply enough water for four to five missions, which is uh, pretty intense. And sometimes that led to more crews suffering than others. So if you just had a resupply mission, sometimes if you went a little bit over your budget, it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, some missions kind of got the scraps that were re remainder and you would have only have half the normal amount of water budget. So you'd have 200 liters of water for the entire mission for six people for two weeks. Uh, or you might only have like half a can of freeze dried chicken and there's no more beef, there's no more eggs. That's all the protein that you get for the entire two weeks. And so some crews ate very little food and had very little water because of just real, real world logistics. Um, in terms of Lunares technical, so some mission control at Lunares was via Discord primarily, and it was with a professional team uh, versus at high seas where mission control was via email. It was primarily a volunteer team. So uh, sometimes it was less professional. Maybe it was students that were just kind of volunteering their time. Whereas Lunares uh, was much more um, responsive and also much more professional because they were like a, the, the professional team. Uh, in terms of suit design. So Lunares sometimes uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, things were difficult because of the suit choices that you chose. Uh, whether it's the helmets that you had, the breathing apparatus, the, the restrictions that you had, physical restrictions, or the layers of suits that you had. Uh, we had some analog astronauts that dealt with a kind of like a heat stroke or heat sickness because they weren't breathing well with their helmets. They had three layers on. Um, in terms of water resupplies at Lunaris, uh, it's a bit easier because you're closer to Piwa. And uh, it's about the same size as high seas. It's like a 2000 liter uh, reservoir, about the same size. Um, and occasionally at Lunaris, based on the mission, sometimes you are allowed to have like emergency resupplies of certain things, maybe once during the mission, depending again on the mission and the commander. Um, whereas at high seas, there was no one there to resupply you with anything. Like in this, yeah, maybe some crazy emergency, but we weren't, we weren't allowed uh, resupplies of any kind of mundane things. And in terms of architecture, um, yeah, high seas felt like a, a space hab just because of the atrium. Huh? <laughs> we, we wrap it up. Wrap it up? Just a small pressure. Okay. Um, yeah, high seas had a primary atrium plus one shipping container for the engineering module. Uh, whereas Lunara's uh, central atrium plus uh, multiple shipping freight containers for the rest of the modules. Uh, and only kind of suggestions were uh, maybe be more structured with the, the analog workouts. So they mimic what you actually have to do in terms of resistance training uh, in space. Uh, maybe painting the ceiling black in the EVA area at Lunaris to simulate the stars and uh, a real sky. Um, maybe having a larger plant room to help with the human factors standpoint and really grow out like having a lot of plants in one room and just see how that affects human factors. And maybe a potential ex experiment where you didn't have the atrium and if there was no high ceiling, how would that affect human factors in your mindset if there's no central area with, with more living experience? Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Paul. Uh, um, we will be wrapping up the yeah. the workshop. So uh, Can Agata, I just, yeah, uh, Agata has the yeah. final points from uh, her team, but then we will be yes, informing be, you what will happen next. It will next. be short because we were very small and we started a bit later. Uh, but uh, most of the topics are actually overlapping and observations. Uh, so I will highlight uh, our ideas for maybe uh, for now, realistic steps uh, for analogs that we can, you know, try try out when it comes to mission designs, uh, gaps, and uh, human factors. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to the size of the crew, uh, as everyone mentioned, yeah, we would like to have bigger crews, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, you still need to have the statistical data. That's why 
uh, some of the habitats are having uh, multiple missions per year. Uh, but maybe the idea for analog community is to just have, um, just try out for the, for the first time having the same experiment or tackled on different analogs. Uh, maybe it should be related to prototyping because most of the analogs have like 3D printing. Maybe it should be like just given task regarding EVAs and see how different crews different in different environment will end up with the results of the of the designs maybe it should be just human factors you know questionnaires are also possible to done in different in different analogs sorry <laughs> sorry crew questionnaires <laughs> uh yeah but those this was our idea for uh something realistic to start maybe having uh bigger teams let's say tackling uh the same aspects at the same time but in different locations the other idea was to have um, mission control uh, in those different analogs working together, maybe having one mission at the same time, trying to solve some problems, uh, not having like all the mission, you know, uh, carried by one mission control, because maybe, you know, uh, it's easier to start still as a separate groups. Uh, but yeah, that's that, that was one of our ideas, uh, of course. Uh, also, one thing that would help when it comes to crew um, studies is more diversity. Uh, so we, someone also mentioned the uh, people with disabilities on board. So that's something that Lunaris is also looking for, uh, hopefully next year. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we, we believe that, you know, having uh, more diversity um can help us prepare for any kind of emergency scenario in the future in space or actually uh Maybe help us different. help us even prepare better for the conditions and for the uh issues that you can uh have uh, in microgravity um the other uh idea for you know we are we were just looking for al alternatives when it comes to how how you can uh, run some simulations without spending a lot of time, a lot of money on creating huge habitats or, you know, huge projects for um, for the missions. So uh, implementing VR simulations uh, or using beehives instead of, you know, uh, big crew as a, as a representative, uh, as an alternative for uh, for cruise behavior, maybe that's the way we we could also approach uh, the problem. And then uh, we also discussed the uh, ah yes, so the time of the time of the mission uh, again, you know, it's usually related to logistics. <laughs> okay, it's also related to logistics <laughs> uh, <laughs> and how much time you know the mission control and the crew members can actually uh, spend on one mission. Uh, but maybe continuing some of the experiments uh, throughout more than one mission. I guess the easiest one would be again uh, prototyping. It's something that we are already doing uh, in Lunaris, uh, but it would also make sense to have it for biological projects. But then you would need to have mission, few missions in a row. So that's also a bit challenging. Um, okay, that's. I see a bit of pressure. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> just to add on the human factors. Um, so we thought that maybe, um, you know, you also, someone also mentioned that uh, having only researchers on board who accept any kind of environment and as long as they can run a study, uh, that's also limiting us when it comes to, you know, running a, a real simulations for commercial space or uh, space, space flights or space tourism and maybe inviting more diverse uh, crew members into into the missions would uh, uh, would, <laughs> would give us a feedback when it comes to well-being inside uh, the stations and how to uh, how to have a design interior design accepted by people coming from different cultures uh, from different backgrounds different age and habits uh, yes, I will. Maybe there was more in the paper, but I feel the pressure. No, 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 no. Just like because that was great. Thank you, Agatha. Because um, what I was asked to do is to tell everyone that this 
uh, two days was full of very nice uh, brainstorming and uh, full of ideas, full of uh, exchanging uh, experiences. And but the workshop is uh, now ending, with the exception that on one, one o'clock, Manuel will have uh, his yeah, his uh, talk. So we are meeting again in uh, forty-five minutes, over an hour. Yes, and then Deepa has her uh, talk at 1.30. Uh, yes, let's stay online, but now we are having, we are getting a break for some time. We need to uh, have our coffee and be ready for uh, next, uh, next talks. But the working part, the workshop part is over, and now we will be listening to some uh, colleagues from, from the community. Uh, see you guys soon, and thank you very much for participating in the first uh, CASM workshop. Oh, hi, hi Lesek. Lesek, can you confirm the times for those online, please? Could you just confirm timings for those online, please? Uh, one and one thirty. One and one thirty for the talks. Uh, our time, our time. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, 45 In 45 minutes. So when you say one o'clock, this is when the next workshop, um, this is when Manuel speaks. Um, basically, I will put everything in the chat. Anybody that signs up later on can see. Are we staying online? So Ferdin is Manuel from Astroland. And as long as we don't miss Manuel. Is uh, Deepa from Austrian Space Forum and UCAM. UCAM and that's CET, both of them, or Polish local type. Thank you very much. Okay, it was a pleasure to have you guys. Bon appétit for those who are having lunch and we'll see you soon in 45 minutes. <laughs>